from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, we're ready. Today is Thursday, September 1, 2011. My name is Joe Manier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm with videographer John Bishop, and we are in the field today to do an oral history interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we're delighted to be in Oakland at the offices of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration with uh, Mr. Phil Hutchings. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Hutchings, thanks so much for sitting down. It's a, it's a pleasure to be, be out here to, to visit with you. You caught me. <laughs> let me. Let me start, um, let's just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about um, your family in Cleveland and coming up there, and obviously that would be some of the entree to all your later civil rights and mm -hmm. other work. Uh, maybe just have you talk a little bit about your folks and coming up in Cleveland. Well, um, my folks are, were migrants to Cleveland. Uh, my dad is from Macon, Georgia. I just visited there pretty recently, about a week ago. And uh, he, as a young man, I'm not sure exactly how old he was, he followed, his dad and his mother divorced, and she stayed in Georgia, and his father went up to Cleveland as part of the Northward migrations and got a job as a streetcar conductor on the old trackless trolleys. And um, my dad followed him, and. I don't know exactly, a bunch of questions you'd love to ask later and never got around to asking at the time. So I don't know exactly, how, but he came as a young man somewhere uh, to Cleveland. My mom uh, uh, was born in, uh, in a little town outside of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Union City. And um, uh, her mother died when she was about a year old. And so uh, she was, passed to one of the sisters, one of her mother's sisters, her aunt. And the aunt lived in Cleveland and was a maid in Cleveland. And so uh, my, my mom came at a very young age, uh, she was too young to be even aware of it probably, to Cleveland and lived out in Cleveland Heights for the most part, though uh, she moved around as her, her aunt uh, got different jobs. And, um, so there's a lot of interest right now because there was a domestic workers uh, bill of rights that was passed in New York State about a year or so ago, and there's one pending uh, in the California State Legislature. So they're trying to look at what has been the history of domestic workers over time. And I just said, oh, my mother wasn't a domestic worker, but she, her, the woman who raised her was, and she used to live in the house where her mother worked as a maid. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, Oh, so I should just say that uh, around that, um, um, they were, I would call, lower middle class. My dad worked at, at, at the post office as a clerk, pretty much all his work life. He, in the mid-50s, he did get a job uh, as a salesman for something called Kaiser Fraser. You're probably old enough to know what that was. And that uh, uh, went belly up. Uh, n not too long afterwards, so I think that basically he said, I better go back to the government where there's a, always a current job. And again, one of these questions you never ask is, I, I'm sure a lot of that thinking was shaped by the Depression. And, uh, and again, that's something we never ever talked about. But at a time in the 50s, uh, where in late 50s particularly, where some of his friends were beginning to become doctors or lawyers or professionals or think about buying their house, he kind of stuck in where he was, where he felt there was surety, uh, assurance as a, as a postal clerk. So it meant being a postal clerk that he was governed by something called the Hatch Act, which means that uh, as, a, a uh, as a U.S. postal worker, he couldn't be a uh, political activist. So he had a lot of interest in a lot of the questions of the day, but uh, that's why he did it through the church. And they, there was this so social and literary forum called the St. James Forum, which was not our particular church, actually. Uh, but he, I, I'm not quite sure of the politics, but he became chair of that for a couple of years. And as a little boy, I would go to some of those uh, meetings and, uh, and there would be local politicians or talking about issues. So 
uh, on one hand, at a very early age, I got some sense of uh, uh, the bigger world, and they were coming right to a church right in our general neighborhood in, in Cleveland. And uh, I remember meeting the late Senator Robert Taft, who was from Ohio in 1952. I was all of eight years old, and uh, Taft was running for the Republican nomination against Eisenhower, which he eventually lost. But as the home senator, he was going around. And the church was one of the places where a lot of the white politicians came to talk to p parts of the black constituency. And so St. James was one of the leading churches for that. And so they got a really good assort sort of. And I remember shaking Robert Taft's hands. And um, I said my, to my dad, I said, Dad, you know, he's got the, some of the softest hands I ever shook hands with. I'm eight year old. And my dad, he was a Democrat, quip, I said, yeah, because he's never done a, a real days of work in his life. <laughs> and I uh, said, <so>, okay. <laughs> so my dad was active at that level, and he was a, he was a deacon in the church, but uh, he was restricted in terms of his politics, though I would always thought about him as a kind of Humphrey, uh, Hebert Humphrey Democrat in the fifth, late 50s, early 60s. My mom, um, uh, as she grew up, she uh, became a social worker. And, uh, and then she eventually uh, went to law school, and, and uh, she had the good fortune, uh, it was one of those days where there were so few blacks moving ahead uh, at that level that, that there was a small circle, so people to knew each other. So she ended up going to law school with Carl Stokes, who became the first black mayor of Cleveland. And when he became mayor, he actually appointed her the chief referee of the Civil Service Commission. And being a typical, I mean, my mind was in the South, what was happening in the Civil Rights Movement, and I guess I wasn't aware of much later how critical a job that was, because they were trying to integrate, or desegregate is a better word, the fire department and the police. And so it was very much a hot seat job. And so, but I never, again, didn't, at the time was not totally aware of a lot of stuff that she was having to deal with and go through, and, and Stokes being the first black mayor, you know, it was, uh, it was just a lot of, it's kind of like, almost like Obama being the first black president. And um, so it was a really time for them, but as a kid, they kind of shielded that. I was aware of it, but not really aware of the, you know, the deep details. And um, so they were very interested. My dad, uh, uh, he, we used to listen to Lowell Thomas on the radio as a kid. And we had one of those old fashioned globes on a stand. And after the Lowell Thomas was over, we'd go over to the Globe, and if there was something about uh, Iran, he'd show me where it was, or Cuba. So I say all that to say that I was getting a sense of the world, and it was from the, right in the family, and, um, and some of the local things. There was nothing radical about Lowell Thomas, but uh, at least it, it, it was the news. And Cleveland, I think, always felt itself kind of uh, the more liberal part of the state of Ohio. It's, uh, and it tended to look east uh, toward New York as opposed to west to Chicago. And so there was a kind of liberalism in the air. Uh, there was a very kind of liberal Jewish community in Cleveland, at, the, at least at that time. I'm, I'm not too familiar with what's going on more re currently. And, um, uh, and there was a lot of ethnic diversity, uh, mostly Catholic, uh, and uh, people from Eastern, Euro different peoples from Eastern Europe. And then you had a very heavy uh, oriented Democratic Party machine, which most of the time I was a kid was controlled by the Irish. So if you were owed anything or you could say what county you were from in, in Ireland, you had jobs like that, you know. And, and, but my mom uh, did get into the infrastructure a little bit in the Democratic Party. She actually ran for state representative and she got endorsed by the local uh, paper at the time, the Cleveland Press. And uh, she did quite well for a first time run. She came in. I think about 20th, and, uh, and there were the first 18 were the ones who got nominated on the Democratic s slate. What year would that have been? I think it was 58. It was either 56 or 58. I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite in my memory. So I, I, I was in high school, and so my mom was running, and I, 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 I helped her from the very beginning. She ran originally for precinct committeeman, and the district kind of m m m mirrored our greater neighborhood. And I was a paper boy for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which still exists. And so I just put her campaign stuff in all the uh, papers, especially the Sunday paper, which you know, was really big and stuff like that. And then when I went to collect money, uh, I, I'd say, don't forget my mother, but she's running for this, and blah, blah, blah. We would like, you know, like your vote. 
So that was some of my first little grassroots kind of political uh, activity and, uh, and very local. And, uh, and then the other piece I mentioned, because I hadn't thought about it for years, was uh, some of our parents wanted us to do something civic. We didn't even use the word political. I don't know if that was a, from the McCarthy period or what, but it was civics and civic interest group. And so they got a, a, a group of us young people together and tried to figure out what to do. And, and I found this word called archegos, which in Greek, I, I have never looked it up since then, since the 50s. It meant something about civic duty or something being part of the, the polity of the society. And so we named the group uh, the Archegos Club, and I, to save my life, I couldn't remember exactly what we did uh, those, back those years, but we did meet, and we did do little local projects and raise money here and there. And then the other piece was, uh, for me, during that time period, was the, there was a group, uh, an adult group called the Council on Human Relations. And they had a youth council, and they brought people from the different high schools uh, into that. And it was a way for me to meet young people, uh, roughly my age, all over the city, because where I lived was predominantly the African American section on the east side. And again, years later, I just realized what a small portion of Cleveland uh, I actually spent 99% of my time in, just the east side. And maybe when I w we went downtown or I went to a ball game at the Cle old, old stadium, uh, it was on technically the west side. But by and large, the west side was white people, and it was a little dangerous. And uh, she, we didn't go there. And so, again, most of my life was in this small piece of geography called certain parts of the east side. And it wasn't until probably my early college years as I was coming back as I was beginning to realize that African Americans were moving not so much to the west side, but to different parts of the east side, which had been kind of off limits to me when I was a kid. And uh, Mount Pleasant area, Shaker Heights, Ludlow area, and, and that Shaker Heights was known for having the first school integration uh, in the country um, during that time period. So uh, there are a lot of things that were going on, and uh, the other piece was there was something called the World Council on Human Re Affairs, and they had different chapters at different schools, and different schools could w they would have a yearly mock, mock general assembly, and each school would be a different country. And I remember in the late fifties. I was at East High School, and we were France, and our, and uh, so this was during the French-Algerian uh, War. So we had to learn all the arguments back and forth, and why France was right, and why Algeria was really part of France, and all that stuff. But again, it was like getting me into some of the broader stuff of the world, and um, and so I look back on it as a kind of important uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. And I guess one other thing I I think that probably looking at today's world was, was important, is my dad, I never could understand quite the principle of a, a labor union uh, in terms of having to be having to force to join. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, democracy, one person, you know, do what you want. So why do you have to join a union? Why do you, why do you have to be forced to join a union? So uh, in 58, in both, actually, California, out here and in Ohio, there was a right to work uh, on, uh, on the ballot. And they lost, ended up losing in both places. And, uh, and out here, that, that was when Mr. Uh, Nolan was running for Senate. Uh, no, governor. He was running for governor because he wanted to be able to command the, you had this tri tri troika. Uh, you had uh, uh, Christopher was the, uh, I think, no, no, the, who, who, was, who was the governor? Uh, Goodwin Knight was the governor. And, and then Nolan was the senator. And of course, you had Richard Nixon as the vice president, and, and they were all kind of big Republicans nationally. And the question was, who was going to control the, the 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 California delegation at the Democratic Party? I mean, sorry, the Republican Party uh, convention in 1960. And so uh, uh, Nolan decided he would just uh, usurp the power and, and and run for governor and pushed Knight aside. And Knight ended up running for Senate and losing. And and um, Nolan ran for governor, and he lost. But the right to work was the, one of the major things. Is unions really probably one of the, the last times that uh, unions really were able to flex their power and be a decisive factor? In, and they were also that in Ohio, though it got less attention than what was happening in California at the same time. 
So, but my dad really convinced me, he was able to show me the imp important power of labor, the importance of unions, and why you know crossing a, a, a union picket line you know was still just awful. Which so stuff I still believe to this day. Yeah. So that was all kind of parts of my beginnings and kind of getting out there. Sure. Did the did so you were born in forty two? That's right. Forty two. Did um, I was born in the middle of Stalingrad? Yeah. 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 And wow. uh, and I guess over in. Pacific, there was the fights around Midway, and so a lot of stuff was going on in the world. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. We did an assignment. I can't remember whether it was in high school or college. I think it was in college. What ha was happening in the world in the in the year that you were born? So it was really fascinating to go look at that, and and read what was happening in, the, in particularly World War II and uh, the struggle for Leningrad and uh, Georgi Zukov and the Red Army fighting the Nazi army of the Wehrmacht and and you know, and and even I think it was after '43 they cut off the World Series for a couple of years and baseball. So you saw the impact the war was having. And hey, I was a little kid. I was being born all this time. Right. Did um, did some of the some of the uh, major events that a history textbook would recount on U.S. race relations of the mid '50s? Did those impress themselves really on you as a teenager? I'm thinking of you know Brown v. Board, Montgomery. Emmett Till, uh, Little Rock. Well, uh, to a great degree, some of some of them did. I mean, uh, I think it was probably the larger things that came out. I mean, as a young man, well, young kid, I guess, teenager. I mean, when I heard about Emmett Till, I mean, that was just uh, frightening. And I should say, as I said, my, my mother is from Tennessee, and as a kid, the first six years of my life, every summer we would go down to Tennessee. And so, of course, when I was one and two, I wasn't aware too much of what was going on. But by the time I was about five or six, I was getting a little handle on uh, it was a little small town, Dyer, right outside of uh, not too far from Memphis, and where we had family. And um, and uh, I I never knew until later that riding on the train, I was riding in a segregated car, and uh, and because usually my dad would come down and take me back, and so we'd ride back on the train back up to Cleveland. From um, I guess Memphis, and um, so I don't aware of any segregated streets or, or signs, and I'm sure they were there. And um, but uh, we also had a, a black newspaper, which I think still exists, called the Call and Post. And the Call and Post at that time was written in I mean it was published it was purple, and people used to sometimes be a little bit embarrassed, so they put the call and post inside the Cleveland press. So if they were on the bus or public transportation, they could be reading the black newspaper, but everybody wouldn't know it unless you're sitting right next, next to them or behind them. But the call and post would have stuff about what was happening in terms of the national um, black community. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in uh, my uh, kind of bio, that I was part of the Youth Council of the NAACP. My dad was a lifetime member, though I think he became that in the early 60s, not the actual 50s. I mean, he was a member, but I think he became a lifetime member in the 60s. And um, so we were aware, I was certainly aware of Roy Wilkins and, uh, and uh, uh, to a lesser degree, Walter White, who had been the, heat, the, the leader of the NAACP before that. But that and the Urban League were the two major black organizations in Cleveland uh, at, in that from being a kid to high school yeah. term period. You, you jumped in, in in, I guess, the spring of 60. Right. Some, yeah, can you describe that? And I guess that would be the reaction to, to Greensboro and all that came after that. It was. Yeah. And uh, so part of it was uh, kind of being in these different circles of um, the Youth Council of the, of the uh, World Affairs, but particularly the Council on Human Relations because we did a lot of interaction between, at that time, African Americans and Jews and, and, we, and, and some degree of Catholic schools and, and to a lesser degree, m the more white ethnics who were uh, fr some from Appalachia, some from the Eastern European countries, a little less. And uh, again, looking back at it, realizing the class was, was a major factor in, in, in who I met at that time and who I didn't meet at that time. Uh, both on the white side and in some ways on the black side as well. The, 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 those early pickets. Um, oh, we're going to stop for just a sec. Hopefully we're back. We're back after just a quick break. Um, Ms. Hutchings, you, you, the, the, I'd love to have you just recall 
uh, being an 18 year old, I guess you would have been, or not quite 18 maybe, but nearly, um, those, those early pickets at dime stores in Cleveland in the spring of 1960? Well, the dime stores were not officially segregated. And again, I didn't think about it at the time, I'm sure at the level of employment, being able to work inside the dime stores as opposed to just come and eat, uh, there probably was some real uh, uh, discrimination and segregation. Uh, and I learned a little bit more about that when I was living years later in the, in the 70s in Detroit in terms of what was happening in the dime stores in Detroit during that same time period. I'm sure it was very similar in Cleveland, right three hours away. But um, I think it was just in some ways being out on the street in front of, uh, in this case there was, there was Woolworths, there was Kresge's, and a store called Neisner's. And they were all right on Euclid Avenue in the, uh, right in the heart for going from the public square out to 6th Street. Uh, so they were all very concentrated. So we could actually hit all three of them you know, pretty easily. And we had signs. It wasn't that we weren't telling anybody not to go in. It was just more informational of what was happening and what these stores were doing down in the South. And um, it, the fact that we were doing this raised a furor uh, in, within the NAACP. And our youth chapter actually got dissolved uh, as a consequence of that. The, the, the complaint was what? Well, the NAACP was not quite pre prepared <coughs> for m more physical action. I mean, they saw themselves as a bunch of, of uh, lawyers. And this, would, this would be a, an enduring thing in the 60s as well. And in, in some ways, even today, the, 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 they've suffered from that because a lot of the legal stuff has been officially done. And, and um, so what's next? And they don't have a great program for that. Um, but then uh, they were very, because Cleveland saw itself as a liberal city, and a lot of the aspiring black leaders at that time were having what we would call today kind of sweetheart deals with some of the white power elite leaders is to have something that was uh, just on the streets. And, the, and the, I mean, if you didn't read the signs carefully, it looked like it could be a, a picket of a, a, a local store. And so the uh, fathers and the NAACP said, you know, this is not, not the right time to be doing this. Uh, there are better things we should be doing. Uh, I can't even think now what those better things are, were. But uh, how do you judge? Though? What was your reaction to the to the disbanding of the, the youth chapter? I didn't care. Issue? I didn't really care. Uh, I mean, th which was the other part is I, in, 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 part of the th my senior year was. Uh, I mean, luckily I was halfway decent student, uh, but uh, my mother was always afraid I'd have bad grades, wouldn't get into good colleges. But I was meeting all these young kids, uh, and there was one grouping of folks I forgot, forgot to mention. Uh, called the, uh, we called it the Circle Pines Club. Uh, and Circle Pines was uh, a camp in Michigan, uh, something I had a sense of at the time it was a pinko camp. And, uh, and more recently, um, that's been totally confirmed. <laughs> and um, a couple of years ago, there was the, uh, what's it called? Uh, there's a labor thing that happens here in the Bay Area every year. Uh, labor, uh, I can't think of the question. But about three years ago, they did this year, but about three years ago, they had something about uh, youth camps uh, around the country that were uh, basically set up by the Communist Party. Uh, not so much per se around indoctrination, but basically around how people from different races could live together and stuff like that and work, play together and learn to, parents could maybe meet each other and have lifelong connections. So the, there was this young group, uh, they were heavily Jewish, but not exclusively, and uh, mostly white, though again, there were a few uh, kids, black kids in it. At that time, it was all white and black. And, um, and so I joined the club because I, I, was, I, I had met one of the kids at one of the, uh, one of the high schools on the, uh, in Cleveland Heights. And so we spent a lot of social time together beyond just the meetings. And so, uh, and there was some interaction between all these, the uh, Youth Council of the NAACP, a Circle Pines Club, Human Relations, and the w Council of World Affairs. And so, it'd be nice to do a little chart sometime of, of what that was. But the point being is that uh, I was getting radical ideas from some of this that was beyond even, at that time, the mainstream. There was another group which was around, which I kind of was aware of, but didn't get close to. And my mother even warned me about it. Remember, she's a Democratic politician. It was called the, the Fair Play for Cuba group. Uh -huh. 
And, um, and of course, this is the time that Cuba, 59, uh, Fidel takes over. And, um, and so uh, the, the they're, they're just being wary of that. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, this is a good, good time to say it. There were three things she told me not to do. She said, Philip, don't get a, a girl pregnant. And that was like the future and all that. She said, uh, uh, don't become a drug addict and don't become a communist. So I said, oh, two out of three, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of that advice was always with the thing that, you know, she was very much in the mainstream. And of course, as I say, she was in this hot seat, which I didn't totally realize at the time. And so I'd say, oh, mom, I'm okay, you know. But, uh, I was getting what would loosely be, I was reading C. Wright Mills and, and uh, um, reading up, you know, this t about the power elites and, uh, at the time and who was it. And, and then I tried to think, well, who would that be in Cleveland or Ohio and stuff like that. And um, uh, I had one very uh, good friend at Oberlin College, which was a nearby college, which has also had a long history going back in some ways to the Civil War and the Underground Railroad. But in the, in the 50s, it was uh, it's got seen as a liberal college. And uh, I'm not quite sure. It must have been some conference, one of those groups I mentioned, where I met a guy named Charlie Butts. And uh, he was his, his family was Republican. And he actually was, this is back in the day where you still had liberal Republicans. And so he was, uh, you know, I hear the, the the democratic stuff from my parents, and the, and then Charlie would come and talk about how they were trying to do something new, and 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 he eventually ran for something. And I don't, I had gone to college, and so I lost track of uh, at a certain time. But so there was a lot of fermentation. That's what I'm trying to say, and uh, on my young mind, um, getting did you, ever, did you ever yourself attend Circle Pines camp? No, I never did. In no, yeah. no. What 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 um what's the story of how you made the decision and to head east to, to Howard? Well, uh, that was my mother. Uh, I had uh, just assumed being an Ohioan, and we weren't very rich, is that I applied to, uh, my, well, but first of all, my mother convinced me that I would never get into, the school I wanted to go to was Columbia and I, in New York. And she said, no, your grades aren't going to be good enough. It's going to be too much competition. So I, I, uh, you know, I applied for something local, Ohio State and Ohio University, which I got accepted to both of them. and. Being in a small town, Athens, Ohio, didn't quite turn me on. So I, I said, well, let's go to Columbus and check that out. So I got accepted. I actually went down there, uh, I signed up. I got a house, I mean, a, a dorm room, even met my roommate who, uh, and then my mother called me up and said, uh, you're not going there. You're going to Howard University. And Why so, she intervened so late? Why, what, what? I, I'm not sure. I think it was a la somewhat of a last minute thing. Like I said, I was, I was already in, had gone down to Columbus, and the school, had, school hadn't actually started yet. But you know, I was looking at what were some of the courses and the requirements, and they said got got in a room and dorm, and and she decided that she really wanted me to be in a place where there were uh, younger, educated black people, part of the aspiring middle class. Jo she wanted me to join a fraternity and and uh, meet n n nice sorority girls and uh, future wife, family, uh, uh, people I could network the rest of my life and felt that was more realistic. And, um, and, she, may have, and she probably was right, you know, in some ways. And um, another hand, which was very interesting at the time, is that Howard University was actually cheaper to go to uh, than Ohio State, even being a state resident of Ohio. Uh, Howard was cheaper, so uh, there was a, some degree of economic. Uh, so they essentially, my dad and mom, dro we, we drove out to Washington, and that uh, was, I think, as a kid, I'd gone to Niagara Falls once, but that that was the only other big trip I'd ever taken. So going to D.C. and going to the East, the nation's capital, was, uh, and then so that's that's how I got out to Howard University. You would, of course, very quickly uh, be, be thickly involved in all kinds of the unfolding. Civil rights activism of the early 60s. Did you, was that on your mind as you drove east? Did you think that was going to be a part of your college experience? Nope. Didn't, didn't, didn't cross my mind. I just wanted to see the Capitol and the Washington Monument and the big city and just be open to a new experience. And I must admit, there are times when I thought, what would have happened to my life if I had stayed in Ohio uh, and gone to Ohio, uh, Ohio State University, graduated, and 
state and the state. I mean, the civil rights movement did become a national movement, so there would have been something where that would have touched me at some level, and just probably given my background, I would have been interested. Um, I knew some folks actually at Central State and in uh, in Wilberforce who. Uh, um, Who got involved? Yeah who, yeah, who got involved. And sometimes who, when I came back to visit in the early 60s, I'd check in with them and just see how things were going. But yeah. it was a very different scene. Yeah. Yeah. Can I take a quick Actually, break for a second? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, we're back. We're, we're back after a short break. Uh, Mr. Hutchins, let me, let me ask. Um, it's interesting. You were just saying that driving out to Washington, D.C., uh, the civil rights future wasn't really the question that was mm -hmm. on your mind at all. Um, tell me about how you. You found your you found your uh, uh, new campus life and the, the activities you you the groups and organizations you, you before long basically became became involved in that would pull you very quickly into a lot of direct engagement with the with the unfolding movement. Well, um, Washington was a great place to be, and on different levels. One is at Howard itself; it had a fair number of foreign students. And the foreign students were basically from three different areas. They were from the Caribbean, uh, Trinidad, uh, Jamaica, places like that, it's a couple of smaller islands. And then they were from different African countries, some of them uh, newly independent. And the third grouping was from uh, Iran. And I never quite understood uh, what was the basis of the, them being there, not that there was anything wrong with them being there. And, uh, but those were the three groups, uh, of, I mean, that had some degree of critical mass. There were some students from other places, too. But this was a prim primarily African-American school. Uh, a, a small number of white students who usually were doing like an exchange, their, maybe their junior year, they'd come to Howard, because uh, it was one of the historical black universities. And, um, but uh, so, when, when, even as a kid, they think of foreign students. I think about France and Germany, and so here I was seeing foreign students from a very, very different part of the world, and hearing it just from their mouths. So uh, um, I'm not sure there was any per se consolidated opinion on anything that they were saying, but it, it was just a different than what you'd read in the Washington Post or or the Star. Oh, I can't remember. There was another paper too uh, in Washington at the time, and um, so that was one piece. Uh, two, I mean, Washington, uh, you had this new guy, John Kennedy, who was the president. And kind of after the 50s, here you had this young man, World War II hero, uh, in his 40s. Uh, it was like a passing of the generations of the torch to a more, a who was pushing a more activist role of government. People were coming, and a lot of intellectuals, particularly the Arthur Schlesingers and all these folks, and you really. It, it was like change was very much in the air, I guess. I, I, and uh, so part of being in Washington was getting kind of used to this and, or just appreciating it. Uh, in 60, the year I got there, of course, you had the presidential election. Uh, after the second debate, John Kennedy came to Howard University campus. Uh, he brought Jacqueline, and, uh, which all, everybody was looking at. We went to, he went to the chapel. And, uh, and talked, and we had just seen him you know, debate Nixon. And uh, so uh, this was not something we were reading about in the newspaper. You know, in Ohio or some other place, this was like right here. Uh, a little later, a few months later, I would see Richard Nixon in, um, in, uh, at, at some uh, Republican presentation. I think it was right in somewhere in, in Maryland, but right in suburban Washington area in Maryland. And, and, and so him speak. So I mean, all of a sudden, the two guys who are going to be running, running for the future presidency of the United States uh, are part of my reality in, in a way that they would never have been uh, in, in a different way. So that was very part, part you know, important. And um, and then there were different events that would happen in the early '60s, the Berlin in uh, '61, uh, most particularly the October crisis of '62, where. We, I remember we were all sitting around watching the Soviet boats come toward Cuba and where they're going to be fired on, where we're going to, and since Washington's the U.S. capital, not like Cleveland, you know, would, would, would we be A-bombed and nuked and would this be the start of World War III and different professors weighing in on their history or experience. So it was very much debates, like what was going to happen? What should happen? Should the U.S. do this? Should the Soviets not do that? Or, and so. These were debates that would never happen pretty much in Cleveland. And uh, so that was part of the milieu from the very beginning. 
the other piece was just be um, being a kind of political joiner, as I always call myself. And um, I joined different groups, and uh, I got involved in the student government. I, I ran for office, didn't win, but uh, I uh, was campaign manager for a guy who ran for the uh, freshman class president. So, uh, and, and then he ran for sophomore, he won again, so I was kind of like the little political genius behind the scenes, uh, uh, getting him re elected and stuff like that. And who was that? His name was Nathaniel Knight. He was from Baltimore, Maryland. And by and large, again, somebody I've kind of lost contact with over the years. And um, yeah. How, tell me about, um, tell me about, uh, I want to understand the, the arc between 60, when you get to fall of 60, and 64 when you go to Newark. Mm -hmm. Because you'll have, I mean, there's a lot that happens here. Uh, Nonviolent Action Group, protests, Easter arrests in 61. Mm -hmm. Not at a core restaurant sitting, I think. Right. Um, uh, you'll go at some point to the South. Mm -hmm. You'll do a lot of work on campus to support Southern student activists. Right. Um, and in 64, you'll go to graduate and go to Newark. Right. So talk, talk me through that arc and how you were finding your way of engagement with all of these questions. Well, uh, probably the e e easiest way to say this is that I come, I come out of uh, Cleveland interested in politics. I get involved in, in politics, uh, campus politics and the school. Then there's this other group of folks, uh, which we call the NAG kids. Um, and some of them had been to the South as early as 1960 and 61. And 61. And so they, kick, they come with a different kind of, of, of experience and be on the campus. Some of them uh, decide to, I mean, in terms of who they are, they, they decide that they are interested in becoming middle class, uh, black, white, there are some of them white, and they, they wear their, their overhauls, which they use in the South and the Southern uh, struggle. They just walk and be around on campus, very noticeable. <laughs> different buttons, one man, one vote, and all this. And so, like, who are these folks? I got attracted to them. And so, uh, eventually I would join. And if anything, that's what cuts through all the rest. Um, uh, I think what I learned originally from the NAG folks is that politics should be about something. It's not just politics that, well, you're my friend, I'm gonna make you president of the class, student class, or, or let's see how much money we can raise for the cotillion, the dance and, and swap. Be alliances between the deltas and the omegas and the, 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 the campus frats is that there were some bigger things that politics, getting power, getting influence, authority should be about, and and I think that probably more than anything else attracted me to these so-called uh, nag kids. Most of whom were, uh, well, a good majority of them, not, though not total, were from the Northeast, New York, we, in some ways. And in that grouping, you had people like Stokely Carmichael, who came out of the Bronx. Uh, who I met in my freshman year, uh, people, uh, oh, um, Cortland yeah, Cortland Cox, of course, was there. We call him, we still call him C. Cox, mm -hmm. and uh, Ed Brown, who was the older brother for Rap Brown, and uh, and um, and, uh, and but but people who were part of the early uh, f freedom movement, but still were keeping one foot in in in, in school at Howard, and then in the summers they'd go south, and. Uh, and so this was a whole new lifestyle. Oh, you do this, okay. Yeah. You don't necessarily just go straight through school and get your four-year BA, but uh, you may or may not. You know, it's more important than what's happening in the South. That kind of uh, scratched me. And I guess what was, and I always say this when I talk to people, what was what, what, the thing is that, you know, Washington was a kind of middle ground between the so-called urban North, Northeast, and the South. And, and in some ways, geographically, and culturally, it was part of the South. And, but it was neutral in some sense that you were out of the South. And so a lot of people who were, we were meeting a lot of folks in the sit-in movement who would come up to Washington to catch a breath of air, maybe raise money, do a few fundraisers, uh, maybe get, if they had a chance, run up to New York, but basically uh, DC would be their headquarters. And so I'd be talking to these people and hearing what, what they were saying, their experiences. The ones that were most, uh, really got me were the high school students. Because here I was in college, and uh, I'm older, 
and I'm reading about Government 101 and political science this and state government that. And these are young folks who are challenging uh, uh, all this with their life. It's the slogan was, put your body on the line. So it was like uh, this word that some of the, my SDS friends came out with later called mindfuck. And that's what it was. It just totally, I mean, it just turned up my whole idea of what was the proper order. I mean, coming out of Cleveland and kind of aspiring black middle class and my mother's training, you know, I was, like, I was supposed to go get a BA, meet a nice girl, get married, be, uh, be, become a professional, get my master's, maybe even doctorate, uh, have kids, and maybe somewhere when I'm in my mid to late 30s, maybe a little noblesse oblige out there, you know, maybe do something, join the NAACP, or get active in the, the community. And, but it was basically a life of preparation. And these were folks who were doing something right now. They weren't waiting to get pre prepared. Uh, and they were changing history and engaging that. And that you're reading in the paper, you know, the, the segregation laws were being challenged in Virginia, right, ne right next door, or Maryland. And, and, uh, uh, and that was totally exciting, you know, and, and just seemed like the right thing to be doing at the same time. I mean, why wait when the issue was right now? And I mean, I guess I would read later uh, Martin Luther King's great thing, Why We Can't Wait, about Birmingham. But it was the same kind of argument. You know, the struggle is now we have to basically put ourselves out there. And we may suffer consequences, but that's, that's the risk. Um, but that's what the risk you take for freedom. And so that it really drew me into a lot of the other things. So specifics were we had created something. Once I joined NAG and got in as part of the group and was learning and doing at the same time, uh, we were staying, having late night conversations in the dorm. And I was learning. Uh, there was a one very influential person named Tom Kahn. Uh, he was white. He was a little bit older. He was from New York. He was with the League for Industrial Democracy, uh, which clearly had a left background. His personal politics were kind of uh, ex Trotskyite. And he had been very much influenced by Max Shackman, who had been in the Communist Party and then had, had, had left and formed a, a, what was called the Shackman Tendency, and which w went into Trotskyism. But Tom was one of the first people who sat down and talked to me uh, uh, about the history of the US left, and w something I would never have gotten quite in the same way by reading a book about it. And um, Stokely never had time to do that. He, you know, he was too much action person. And uh, we have, I mean, we have conversation, but other kind of conversations. Like, are you coming to the demo? Uh, uh, how many people can you bring? Can we get money from the student government to, 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 to do this, to send food and clothing to Mississippi? Those kind of conversations. Um, but uh, Project Awareness, which Tom formed, uh, and we were all part of the, we, we were all, I mean, we were all part of each other's things, uh, brought controversial speakers to Howard's campus. Uh, the first one we did, was we, we brought Malcolm X. And of course, the uh, Howard University campus fathers shit in their pants. And uh, so knowing that, we, uh, we uh, tempered it a little bit to have it into a debate. And so we brought Byron Rustin down, who was in some ways the godfather and mentor for a lot of these young people from the New York crowd. And it became one of my mentors also. Um, to basically debate uh, Malcolm X. And so we got a huge turnout and, um, uh, and, and that established project awareness on the campus. And then we also brought Herbert Apfecker, you know, known communist and the idea of having an actual real live communist at Howard University, which got a lot of federal money. That was what made them nervous, I mean, in, in many ways. And then also some of them had gone through the McCarthy period. And then that's a whole nother side story of how some of the brilliant minds in the political science department were writing treatises on, you know, literally, like, how does my flower grow during the 50s? Because they were totally scared uh, to lose their jobs and stuff like that. And, uh, I mean, and they could talk about it in the classroom, but they couldn't really publish and put their view, viewpoints out and, and stay at Howard and feed their payment, feed their families and pay their rent and all that. So you got to see some of the repercussions also of taking pol political stands, and that was important as well. So... Uh, How about the experience of being arrested and then... Oh, we're going to stop for a second. 
Let me ask you about the, the impact on you of the experience, say, of being arrested, of being in demonstrations, of to shift from mm -hmm. thinking about one set of issues and political involvements on the one hand and then this action mm -hmm. change now on the other. Did, what were the impacts on you of, of that shift in what you were doing? Well, you know, I talk about this a lot to some of the students today, and there was a dramatic impact, and, the, and, and, and the basically is freedom, uh, my personal freedom because I became my own person. And uh, I got arrested at a place in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we worked a lot with the Congress of Racial Equality. It was led by a guy named Julius Hobson at the time, who somewhat of a national spokesman in CORE. And um, given that these were, CORE was mostly middle class professionals, uh, they needed uh, basically uh, some soldiers who could basically afford to get arrested. Or, or, or even demonstrate during odd hours. So they call up uh, NAG in, in, in D.C. Or, uh, and they did some things in D.C., but one of the things we were doing was Baltimore, I mean, sorry, Maryland was officially a segregated state. Uh, and so was, so was Virginia. And we would go over to Virginia, go to some of the movie theaters, because blacks either had to sit in the balcony or they could only go on certain days. And this was like Falls Church and Arlington and places really close to, to D.C., you know. And so segregation wasn't just something you'd read about. It was just, you know, just really right across uh, uh, the state line. Uh, Maryland, we had this Saturday in, in spring of 1961, and we, I, I got assigned with a small group of people to go to this place called the White Rice Inn. White Rice, Rice Inn. It was a Chinese, a Chinese restaurant. And Maryland had the state accommodations law, which uh, they could serve whoever they wanted to. And if there was any troublemakers, they, that basically the owner or the, uh, the proprietor would come out, read the, cite the law or read it, and if you didn't leave in five or 10 minutes, they'd call the police and have you arrested. So this particular day, we went to the White Rice Inn. Uh, we sat down, uh, kind of, we knew we weren't going to get served, but we just kind of were looking at the menus and having side conversations. So it was a racially mixed group. I remember there uh, was about, I think there were five or six of us, and at least there were two white people. One was a woman, one was a guy, and uh, I can't remember if they were from Washington schools or from, or from Baltimore schools. Just can't remember that. And uh, so we sat there for about maybe half hour, and so the guy was getting nervous, and so finally he comes over and says, and is he is he white or Asian? He, he's Chinese. Yeah, he's Chinese. And says, uh, look, you know, uh, uh, I I sympathize with your cause. And, and at one time he said, you know, I'm a colored man too, you know. And he actually said that. But uh, you know, this is bad for business, and I'm gonna get in trouble. And uh, you know, could you please leave? You know. And um, he said, no, we're gonna sit here for a while. And so finally he gets really desperate, and he comes up and says, well, look, I'll make a deal with you. I have another restaurant over on the other side of town, and it's called the Brown Rice uh, Chinese Restaurant. And if you go there, I, I'll call ahead. It's all on me. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay for your meal, your lunch, whatever, and uh, just go there and it'll be all over. And we said, uh, not today. Should have said, we'll take a rain check though. <laughs> we didn't think to say that, but I, we said no. So we stay there for another while, so finally he has to do, the, do his duty and bring out the public accommodations lot and, and read it to us. And so he reads it to us, and um, um, we sit there for about 10 minutes and say, uh, he's going to call the police. Um, well, we've, I think we've accomplished what we set out to do here today. We've disrupted his business. He's, he's totally f freaked out on, on us and stuff like that. He's not doing any real business, and other people f keep looking at us and wondering if there's going to be some confrontation with the police, and they're nervous, and some people decide not to come in and all that. So we decide it's time to leave. So we walk outside, and we look at each other, and we just said, we just, we just messed up here. You know, we just, we're supposed to get arrested or at least bring the police out. And we have just literally, I think the phrase we used at the time was we just punked out. And um, probably wouldn't say that quite now, but uh, that's what we said then. And, and, then, and, I, and then I came to mind all these young high school students who I had seen, I was telling you about, that I had met at Howard and who were younger than me, who were getting arrested. And, and, 
And uh, how are they going to look up to us when, uh, when uh, we're f afraid to do stuff? So we decided just there. Someone said, I think it was a young woman. She said, let's get arrested. So we just literally sat down on the stairs in front of his restaurant. So people would have to climb in or climb out of us, around us, or couldn't, couldn't get in. And um, of course, he freaked out, the restaurant owner. So he called the police. And we just uh, we, uh, linked arms. And uh, the police couldn't pull us apart. So they, they had to call another police car, and then the paddy wagon. And eventually, they got us apart, and we got us in jail. But um, they didn't beat you up. Nope, they didn't. I mean, we got a little roughed up a little bit, taking uh, in, in putting us in the paddy wagon, but not anything serious. And, and since one, I said two of them were were women. You know, we said, "Watch out for her!" You know, "Don't hurt her!" and all that kind of stuff. But um, what I realized was that all of a sudden, something was more important than going back to do my assignments at Howard for the weekend. Uh, something was more important than uh, maybe a party that might be happening uh, Saturday night. Uh, something was more important than what my mother might think uh, about uh, my future or how this might fall on her career and all that. And that's what I mean about liberation. It was real sense that all of a sudden I was making a stand. It could, be, it could have been about something entirely different. But I was making a stand for what I wanted my life to be about. And while I was aware of other opinions, uh, I was doing what I really wanted to do. And I was willing to take whatever responsibilities, in this case getting arrested, uh, for it. So in that sense, it was a really, it, it was crossing a Rubicon of sorts. And, and it was very much uh, uh, saying, this is my life. And I'm going to live it and take the consequences. And it, it was a very much of a freeing kind of thing. That's what I meant by freedom. Let me, let me touch on a few things, and then we'll pick up the, the, the narrative again. Um, is anything happening in the classroom at Howard that's, that's really pushing you forward in these ways, too? Or you had earlier said that there's kind of a disconnect there. But was there anything, any faculty, any class that made a difference in, in, the, in the sense of really mm -hmm. looking at your intellectual perspective? In mm, a not really. OK. I, I, in some ways, I was very disappointed with Howard. Okay. Uh, I thought it was kind of like a 13th grade. Uh, you, know, you, you go through 12 grades of high school, then 13th grade. And then I guess after I read Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man, I said, well, the, you know what this looks like? It's like one of these newly developing countries in Africa. And it, it, it felt very colonial in some sense. Uh, one, because we were getting money from the federal government. The administrators were very worried about what you know, the real powers to be were thinking and doing. Um, uh, the first couple of years I was taking requirement courses, biological science, uh, uh, chemical s s s stuff. And um, there was a political science teacher I liked, a guy named Robert, I think it, I his last name was Martin. I think it was Robert. And he was active in the local Democratic Party in, in D.C., and that was somewhat interesting. And uh, as I got a little further along, there were um, a couple of teachers. One was a very fascinating guy named Bernard Fall. Uh, Fall was a Frenchman who had fought in the French Resistance. And he had also been involved in Vietnam and Algeria. And so he brought a certain kind of uh, sense to the, the courses, as classes that you would get from, I mean, anywhere else. I mean, so li listening to him talk, we could have been at Harvard University or say anywhere, and we knew we were getting a first class uh, thinking about this. Um, and, uh, uh, but by and large, the classes were disappointing. I, I even took a course in what was then called Negro history, and it was totally boring. It was all about dates. and. Uh, and well, in 1615, what happened in the Songhai Empire? Or, or, and no sense of context, what was happening in the bigger world that was shaping Africa or that Africa was dealing with. Or it was, it was like history with no politics. And I mean, that would change, uh, particularly in the late 60s, uh, both in Howard and other places with black studies and a whole different focus. But that I didn't get it there. And, um, and I, in fact, I remember in. Uh, November 63, when Kennedy got killed, we were all on the campus, and the, in fact, there was a Negro history class, and we all they, they they just told us to all come out on the campus, the whole school, and because they wanted just to say this, what had happened one time, and um, uh, in terms of President Kennedy, and so we were all on the campus, and and but it, it, it was a boring campus. I mean, interesting people. 
both some of the professors and stuff like that, but just the arrangements of, of being able to teach and going through the, the regimen was, 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 was very limited. I'm really interested in, in having you stop and reflect a little bit about the gender dynamics inside the movement in these years as you were experiencing both mm -hmm. on campus and in your engagements with Maddox, Nick, its mm -hmm. core, etc. Um, by and large, we didn't think about gender in that sense. It wasn't a big problem. I mean, um, I mean, I, I can say it as a man, of course, too. Uh, but um, women were were very much around, very active. Uh, they weren't being secretaries. And uh, in fact, when I first joined NAG, uh, a woman named Jeannie Bell, who I again lost contact with, was one of the one of the leaders of the local. She and Bill Mahoney were uh, the, the kind of the key leaders of NAG at that time period. Uh, there were women in, in, in who, like uh, Jean Wheeler from Detroit, uh, who would go to, who would uh, go south. She would marry Frank Smith, who also went south. Who later Frank Smith would later become a D.C. city council person. Uh, Ruth Howard, another person who was a good friend of mine, was very active, and um, some others that maybe right this second aren't coming to mind, but. Uh, uh, and then, because at a certain point, NAG, NAG never got recognized on Howard's campus, which uh, we'd always try to get rec recognized. And then, at a certain point, we realized this was a good thing. We were not getting re recognized, because once we got recognized, the only reason we got recognized is that we could have meetings on campus, and we could get, we could get campus money as a student group. And we quickly realized there were much more important things to do than the, either, either one of those two. And we'd have meetings out in, the, out, out in people's homes, out at other campuses. We met with kids from Georgetown, American University, George Washington, uh, Cap Catholic University, in a way that if we had been just a, a um, uh, uh, one, one school, it uh, would never have happened. That's why I, in my bio I have about the D.C. students for civil rights. That's kind of came out of those connections, uh, and that uh, and we didn't have to answer to anybody, you know, uh, in terms of uh, what we could do, where we could meet, and all this, which would, would, would happen as a student group. So it became a very good thing not to get, uh, exactly. you know. Yeah. Let me ask too. Um, you, you mentioned as a child that you'd go down and visit in Tennessee in mm -hmm. summers and such. Had you been into the deeper south before you went down? And I think it was maybe what '62. Uh, no, it was a little later, 64. But I, what I did do is uh, I did go back to Tennessee because it, it, um, uh, because it was one of the summers. Uh, I want to say, yeah, it had, it had to be 62 because 63 I was doing March on Washington stuff. Uh, but I wanted to see as a young man stuff I had seen or missed seeing as a young kid. And uh, there was a little bit of a movement, not a big movement in, in, in Memphis at the time, and particularly not in the smaller, smaller towns, but I had cousins. And so I went, to, so that was the official reason to go and see cousins. And I had a kind of a big uh, older cousin, uh, I always called her big sis, still do. She's still alive, 10 years older than me. She lives in St. Louis now, but she, has a, she still has a house in Dyer, Tennessee. And, um, so I just go around, and, I, and all of a sudden, I did see the segregation signs. I did see white people I, who, who somehow I must have seen as a young kid, but didn't really dawn on me because uh, it was like pretty much a, like a black rural world that I was kind of in, in the, as a young kid. And, um, and then I saw some of the reaction where some of the folks were trying to do something around civil rights and, and the ra uh, uh, voter registration and the, ha and the harassment they were getting. So that was, I mean, just as like revisiting my past, but in a different way. Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to have you describe um, your your experience in, in, in Mississippi in '64 because you you helped with the MFDP effort, and that of course concludes there sort of has that great debacle mm -hmm. of a climax in Atlanta City. Well, going to Mississippi in '64 was. Um, is, uh, I went slightly limited uh, in terms of I was working on something very particular. So there were friends I knew from NAG who had gone, as I mentioned, in the summers. And so uh, I went to a couple of projects, mostly in the second, second con congressional district. One of them was Ruleville, where, where Mrs. Hamer was, Fannie Lou Hamer was. And, um, and, but I knew a lot of the, the, the staff people. Uh, Stokely was doing stuff, and uh, 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 Ivanhoe Donaldson was around. and. Um, uh, some other people I'm not thinking about at the moment. And so, but my, my focus was to try to work with the, in the, the uh, 
Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party with the focus on the challenge that was coming up at, in uh, later that year. And, and what we wanted to do, because nobody trusted state officials, is we wanted to get the records of people who had f registered to vote and basically get their signatures, make duplicates, and then take them out of the state. And so, the, so I was kind of in and out, going to different projects, but sitting in a lot of meetings, and, and also particularly with the people going out to see people who were doing voter registration, and, uh, but really being in the community meetings. And um, I mean, I probably the thing that I think about that I valued the most was seeing people making attempts to do democracy at the very most grassroots level. And also, the other piece, which was probably in the long run even more important, uh, though why, why compare them, is um, people being able to have complicated th or, or discussions with basic language with people who hadn't gotten through probably even high school, you know. And so, but how do you do that kind of conversation without dumbing it down? And that was, the, and you could only do that from the standpoint of organizing and developing relationships because part of it was learning how people use language. And so you, you couldn't just come down and, and, and talk or even, because then it, you say, oh, these, these poor people, they only have sixth grade or less education, so I have to t talk in one syllable words. And that's the wrong approach. Though it's the one that somebody is just coming in for a quick visit naturally would, you know, would think. So our approach was from organizers who had been there at least all summer, maybe several summers. Some people just decided to be there and, and, and dropped out of school. And to work on this is that you were able to know how people thought of their thinking patterns, how they approached ideas, what was the language they used around those ideas, and, and then how to, so in that language, uh, it wasn't so much like a foreign language, but it was, it was kind of dialect at some level, is to basically talk about registering to vote, state government, and particularly a, a restrictive state government, and uh, what were some options around strategy in a ways that appeal to them and, and where they could participate. And I think, you know, that's probably the greatest lesson I learned. Uh, you know. And, you know, watching Mrs. Hamer, you know, uh, just, you know, talk to people, sometimes break out into a song. And the song would be not just a song, it would be a reflection of the mood in the room. And, and, and therefore the words would pick up on what people were thinking about, feeling about, maybe wanting to do, maybe scared. Uh, whatever, but, but 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 maybe you couldn't just say that in a, in, a, in a conversation, so you had to take a song to do that, and seeing the power of of of, of, of how that cultural manifestation is able to be used in a very political way. That was a profound learning. Yeah, yeah. I've been asked, and just in, not incidentally, I think uh, you had come up in the church in Cleveland, I guess. Mm -hmm. were, were you? Would you have said of yourself at the time that you were a person of faith? Is that a Part of how this was no, for you? no, I wouldn't say that at all. Okay. Uh, I thought church was pretty boring too. <laughs> I, I, I like Sunday school because it was about history, yeah. you know, the Philistines and the Israelites and the, the Romans and all that. But uh, I you, could, excuse me. yeah. So I could follow that, but I never really felt that God was in our church. And it was a nice church, middle class church. It's still there in the University Heights, Circle rather, in Cleveland. But I mean, God's supposed to be everywhere. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, why do I have to go to that church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning to be in God's presence when I could do that at home or be with some friends or, uh, or we could have a meeting out in the park, you know, and, and, and do the same kind of thing. But why this church business? Did you go out down to the city? Did you get, um, did, did you find yourself in a place where you, you were, ha had to be because of the circumstances fearful, actively fearful for your faith? Oh, yeah. What are the things actually that we're doing right now, uh, relatively speaking? Uh, is, that is the Bay Area Veterans of the Civil Rights Movement, yeah. is we're actually doing, we tape recorded some discussions of then and now and all that, yeah. and one of the ones we're doing is, a, is around fear in the movement. And I mean, it's impossible, I mean, Mississippi, I mean, Nina Simone said it, you know, Alabama's bad, uh, Georgia's awful, but Mississippi, god damn. And it was like the worst. And uh, you were literally were going into a battleground. And the only comparison that I've been able to get in terms of conversation or listening, because I never went to Vietnam, uh, which is a whole other story, but um, uh, is talking to people who were in Vietnam and just the fact that they were, uh, they were in a pressure cooker 
There was no way to get out of it. And that's anything could happen at any moment. And that's the closest I felt in terms of the Mississippi experience. And then says I didn't stay there that long, but but talk to people like my friend who's here now, a guy named Wazir Peacock, Willie Peacock, you know, who's from Mississippi and talked about being a civil rights activist in that kind of pressure cooker, or people like Hollis Watkins, who's still down there with a group called Mississippi Echo, even now today. And it's like uh, this is a war zone, and uh, you could get killed any time, sniper. Uh, it could get you just like in Vietnam, or, or uh, it could be a straight out of salt. Um, we had to know how to talk to the state officials who would come out uh, after you and and tell you to get out of town, and and yet you had to stay there, but also not directly confront them one on one because they had the guns, they had the law, they had you know they had everything, and I mean they had the FBI watching but doing nothing and. So yeah, it was uh, uh, literally a pressure cooker, and and uh, I mean, w the, I mean that's why to some degree where we lived together in project houses. I mean, part of it was that I mean, if I was living by myself, I'd be totally freaked out. And I guess about my whole time in the movement, I you know publicly say as a way to get people thinking is that ninety percent of the stuff I did there in the movement I probably would never have done on my own. And I could only even think about it and summon up the courage to do some of this if there were other people who were involved with me and we were doing it together. And so I, I say that to younger people today and even some adults as a way to think about, you don't have to do this all by yourself. And part of the power of being able to f work for social change is that you have people in some institutions, not a whole lot. Uh, in the South, the church was very important when it was kind of a sanctuary. But uh, um, you know that really gave us some degree of backbone. So when times when people were in jail, they'd sing and drive the jailers crazy. So they would be glad to get us out of there, you know, because stop making so much noise. And but it's like I could hear, I couldn't see you, but I could hear you singing. And so Paul and Silas bound in jail. Then you do the next verse. And so we were creating community right in the jail. And um, so I mean that fought that fear though. That's what it was. What it, it was about. Not just singing, but it was about fighting fear. Or I remember getting tear gassed in, in Cambridge, Maryland in, uh, what was that, 64. George Wallace came to town, uh, Cambridge, Maryland, Eastern Shore of Maryland, because he was running for president. Uh, huh? That was tough, Biden, Cambridge. Yeah, and so we were out there marching on the front lines, and, the, and you saw the, tr the, the National Guard, and they were pointing these, uh, uh, turned out to be t uh, uh, tear gas uh, uh, canisters at us, and we, we had we couldn't stop marching, so we started saying, "We are not afraid," you know, and keep on, and keep marching. And we, of course, we got tear gas, and then, but again, we clutched and helped each other. A guy named Reggie Robinson, uh, who uh, was in SNCC, and he's now in D.C. And I mean, we were right together, and we fell together, and we kind of staggered out of the out of the crowd and and back to uh, safety um, that night. And um, Rap Brown was there, and. Uh, he, he, he got arrested, or re-arrested, probably more accurately. And, um, and I remember I went back to Howard University uh, in my, my fatigues and tear gas. I went straight to my ROTC class and deliberately wanting to smell up the whole place, you know. Like, okay, Hutchings, where have you been? You were ROTC? Yeah, he had to be. It was mandatory oh. for two years, yeah. yeah. Um, did, did Atlantic City... Was it, was it a point of transition for you or, uh, or a point of continuity? Well, it was continuity in the sense that it was another part of the struggle. But just given what happened there and uh, that the MFDP did not get seated and people left, there was a real depression that settled on the movement. And did you feel that yourself? Um, you know, I think that right away. I mean, I was sorry, that, you know, I was upset that we didn't win, you know, that, that practical politician part of me is like, if we only had done this or this or this, uh, of course, um, but we were dealing with Lyndon Johnson. And, and, and so um, it probably in the long run wasn't possible. And so I think it sank in at a later time. Uh, it reminded me in some ways of, I remember when my mother died, you know, much later, uh, in, in the 90, 1991, as I went out to Cleveland and went to the funeral, I'm only child, did all this stuff, and and then uh, I took care of the burial, met with the minister, all that, and 
good soldier, came back to California, and I, I was doing consulting at the time, so I, I had to get my back on stuff, and all of a sudden my body just closed down on me. It's like say, okay, you wanna do all that stuff? I'm not moving. And for like two weeks, I just sat in the house and basically mourned uh, my mom. And I think something not quite as dramatic, but something very similar happened in the same way. It was a little delayed reaction, that's what I'm gonna say. And, and it was like literally what to do next. And as you saw from my bio, I went back to uh, up north and uh, where some friends that I had from the, again, from the NAG days uh, and ended up working for Robert Kennedy and in a very interesting position as a research, uh, research and speakers bureau because he was running against a liberal Democrat, I'm sorry, a liberal Republican, Kenneth Keating. And somehow beyond the hype of being a Kennedy, you had to kind of say, well, what's the difference between being a liberal Republican and a liberal Democrat? And so that's the research part uh, that came in very useful in being able to do that. And then, of course, the speaking part was to go out and, and basically speak. And of the people around at that time, I, I mean, I was feeling that Kennedy was probably Robert, even though we used to call him all kind of names when we couldn't get any federal assistance down in Mississippi or uh, the South, is that he at least understood what that experience was. And he was growing as, you know, later things and that he could become more than he was at the time. And nobody else quite seemed to have that. And so being a Kennedy, he would make a major mark on the Democratic Party and maybe the country. And so that was kind of my rationale for, for working in that campaign. But it was also, it got me out of Mississippi, it got me out of that funk, and, 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 and basically put me in a different situation. How would you find your way to Newark? Well, that's, uh, it's fairly immediate because I went to Newark in December of, uh, 1964, and, and the election for Kennedy was in November of 64, of course, right across the river. Um, but uh, this has to do another little piece. Uh, I guess I think I'm one of the few people in the movement who was both an SDS and SNCC at the same time. I had this really crazy idea, uh, which didn't really work out, it was interesting, is that SNCC was mostly an activist organization. So somehow, I would do my action in SNCC, and then uh, SNCC was, uh, SDS did a lot of these working papers on state and society, America and the new era, what was the meaning of corporate liberalism, all kind of interesting stuff. Uh, a guy named Richard Flax, who's hit down in Southern California now, was one of the key people, Tom Hayden. And back in 64, uh, early part of 64, I'd gone up to Ann Arbor, Michigan for a conference uh, that they were putting on, and um, I got to meet a lot of these people, and one of my good friends who was part of the old Circle Pines group in Cleveland, a guy named David Strauss, was a student up at, uh, at the University of Michigan, and he was also very active in the, in the voice chapter, uh, the student group, uh, the SDS political party at, at, at UVM. So it was through him I got to meet people like Tom Hayden and Al Haber, who were the formers of SDS, and, and um, so I say that, that that's where it, that piece started, and then I uh, got to know some of the SDS people in uh, in um, in D.C. There weren't that many, mostly around George Washington University, and they mostly were in the peace movement. Uh, um, and um, at the time, and some of them individually had done certain things in the civil rights movement, particularly uh, some of them had gone north to Chester, Pennsylvania, right outside of uh, Pen uh, Philadelphia, and been active in community work there. But uh, anyway, uh, SDS had started these uh, economic research and action project to do actually do work in the field, and the model was thick. Uh, they were gonna try to do what they call the interracial movement of the poor. And um, they had ch uh, places in Chicago, uh, Cleveland, um, Boston, Boston and, and I'm probably missing some place. Yeah, ba yeah, Baltimore joined in, in Baltimore. And so uh, I went to a party and ran to Tom Hayden. And we got to talking. I, I, I always say he got me drunk. And so, so he said, why don't you come, to, come over to Newark, see what we're doing, you know? It's a lot like SNCC, and hey, you know, you're from the North, and uh, uh, you, you probably could help us out on some stuff. And so probably with the liquor and wanting, and still in this post-Atlantic City thing, 
Um, I, and I knew I wasn't going to do anything with Kennedy. I mean, he was going to be—he became senator, and that was good at the time. But I, I had no dreams of wanting to go to Washington and do that. So I said, "Well, let's go to check out uh, Newark." And it was appealing because they, at the time, were talking about a statewide movement, and the idea that, in terms of the '60 census, New Jersey was at that time the most—I don't still maybe, but it, that was the most urbanized state in the country. So the idea was to start in Newark and um, Hoboken, and uh, they had a project in Hoboken, went in Newark, and we talked about doing something in Elizabeth, uh, and then maybe working down to Trenton, and there were some university people at, at New Brunswick and also at uh, Princeton that in terms of the academic level and research would be helpful. And so it was like a statewide movement. It wasn't just like going to one city, even though you were technically in one city, but the idea was going to to there, and so that was appealing, and then you, and then the New Jersey Turnpike, you know, you could just connect really easily from city to city, place to place, which you couldn't do in Mississippi so easily. So uh, that was attractive, and so uh, I'd always wanted to be in the North and do stuff. And I had this little quote uh, that the success of the anti Jim Crow would be to turn Birmingham into Chicago, and uh, um, places like uh, at, you know. Atlanta would become like New York. And so we would be facing the real problems of this country in a way that segregation, racial segregation, had not allowed it to happen. And so this great victories that we were getting, and, and, and which were hard fought and well earned and well deserved, were basically just putting us into the situation where we, where we were like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And was America that greater country economically, politically, and for freedom? And so that had always been my focus about wanting to work in the North. And so Newark, you know, opened that possibility. And, and SDS had a project, and uh, they actually, most of their organizers were white. Uh, they had a couple of black organizers, and the, but the, the, that was the part of the, is, it, it, I, I, you know, I could claim false labeling. I mean, we got there, there was no interracial movement of the poor. There were no white people who wanted to work with us. Uh, we were, I mean, Stanley Aronowitz and other people had done all these su surveys on unemployment and particularly focused on the New Jersey. And that was, the, and we thought we were gonna work around unemployment. Well, that was not the issue people wanted to work on. They wanted to work around housing and, and rent and police brutality and things like that, which is what, you know, you do what the folks wanna do. You're, you're, you're organizing other, or you don't have a real project. So we ended up doing that, and it was mostly, you know, black community, and and um, we broke with the kind of more liberal group, the Clinton Hill uh, Neighborhood Association. Uh, a guy named Stanley Winters uh, was head of that, and uh, they had a very limited, kind of very, just generally at the time, liberal, and we wanted to, to do more than that and raise basic questions, and so we broke off in the low, what was called the lower uh, Clinton Hill section and uh, became a, a real power base. Yeah. And, um, and then eventually, uh, a year later, we'd start doing stuff in, uh, in uh, the Central Ward of Newark, which was a more, even more uh, black and more poor and, and, and kind of the cesspool of, of Newark. And I remember being with Tom Hayden uh, in 65 during the Watts Rebellion, and we were sitting there talking, look, looking at it on TV and saying, I wonder if this is going to happen in New Jersey, in Newark, and uh, and more importantly, what would what we would what would that impact be on us? What we, what should we be doing, and so on, and and so we out of that conversation and bringing other people into it, we developed a strategy for the next what became we didn't know when the next two years, so that when the Newark Rebellion actually happened, you know we had a, a game plan and an organizing thing of how to to work on this, and it, it was basically as the movement, this was going into the mid-60s, becoming more racial conscious and the more black focus, is we, we began to put issues in more racial terms. And since Newark was predominantly black at that time, still is today, uh, and the people who were poor and destitute were, were also po uh, poor blacks, and but the power structure, in this case, unlike Cleveland, which was Irish, were Italians, and is that we began to pose that. It was like Newark was this, uh, it was kind of many, this was when the third world concepts were heavy and, and people, so we were like a, 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 a colonial African nation struggling against these white, European, Italian, American uh, 
colonialists to, to get our liberation. And we didn't quite say it that way, but that was the, that the general thought. And so, as I mentioned in the bio, we were talking about black institutions and, and black power, community control, of schools, neighborhoods, et cetera. You would get black, more black policemen. And I remember going, going through, you know, and this is where some of the class stuff gets in involved too, because, well, why are you arguing for black policemen? And because uh, police arrest people, they re they're agents of the state. And our answer was, which wasn't true in Mississippi too, was, well, people have never seen black policemen. And until they actually see a black policeman, get, up, get beat up by a black policeman, uh, they won't get to see what police are really about. They're, they're, they're gonna think it's really a white control thing. And so they have to get it at the level through direct experience of seeing the system at work using black people. But if, no, if there are no black people at the higher ranks of the city, of the system, which includes mayors and Congress people as well, then, I mean, this is where we get into with some of our left friends who were just way out in left field, literally, is that you can't talk about socialism or capitalism at, at, at a level when people are feeling the racial thing, you know, most heavy in their daily life. So, I mean, that became some of the things. So we spent a lot of time polarizing. And what's interesting in terms of new experience for me looking back on it is we were, you know, we had some real power. And I mean, the authorities really had, look, because we had a real grassroots base. And nothing I've worked with in the same way since uh, has had that type of grassroots base where the mayor and the city council, you know, were very, uh, you know, concern, leery what we were going to do, uh, tried to bring in some of the old, what we call the, the Uncle Toms, who were the Negro politicians. And I mean, they literally broke our windows and, 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 and slashed some of the tires of the people in the car. And one time we were in the middle of Springfield Avenue, we were almost going to have a physical altercation with them. And I forget how that stopped, but it, it, didn't, it didn't actually happen. And the guy who was, uh, head of the, the local Democratic Party in the Central Ward, a guy named Euless Honey Ward. Uh, very good guy, but he was totally into the old framework. He, and, and he wanted to knock our blocks off because we were these new folks and, and all these white radicals from SDS had really set us up to do this and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you, you probably heard variations in the story. So it was very thrilling, if to say the least. And, uh, and uh, we lived in the community. Uh, I stayed. Uh, we, we did have a project house at one time when we got a little bit more money. Uh, we got most of our money from labor unions. Um, and probably, a, a, I know the UAW gave us some money, and I can't, there was another union, which I can't remember now, they gave us some money. And some church money, mostly from the um, Episcopal Paleans Church, which is how I got in contact with Nathan Wright. Um, and which we, we, he would write a book on black power in Newark, but more importantly, he, uh, was the organizer for the uh, first Black Power Cong uh, Conference right after the Newark Rebellion. Yeah. And he didn't have that grassroots thing. That's how, that was my role to come in and do that. But um, he had other kinds of ties, which I didn't have. And, uh, and um, yeah, so that, that was useful. Let me ask how you originally came up. No, pause for a second. <laughs> Take a little break. Okay, we're back. We're back on. Let me ask, how, how are you bridging between SDS and and say Central Ward, which is in basically entirely black, and how how are you managing between how are you managing the race and class questions simultaneously in an organizational sense? Well, in terms of um, what we call NCUP, Newark Community Union Project, which was an SDS-oriented organized project, is that that pretty much had been t entirely organized by SDS. Uh, most of their work was. Well, well, pretty much all the work, except with the, had been in the South Ward, except with the, some of the little forays that mostly Tom had done, Tom Hayden had done in the Central Ward, and we had done that together. Um, but um, at a certain point, by '65, uh, the I think they, some of the white folks, were realizing the limitations of white organizing in a predominantly black community in a way that had not really been raised quite as heavily in in the early 60s or even when the project first started. And, and since this idea of the interracial movement of the poor was not happening, um, that um, uh, it, it wasn't like they could go with, to white folks and offer the hand of unity and bridging the gap and all that. So th some of them began to play more technical roles, fundraising, uh, doing research um, on city structures, which was totally useful. 
because frontline organizers never have time in any struggle to do that kind of stuff. Uh, making ties, ties with some of the university people, uh, but playing a less visible role. They also got race baited. I mean, Leroy Jones, who was a, who was Newark was his home base for where he'd grown up, and he had f formed uh, his group called the Spirit House. Um, uh, actually, kind of race baited, uh, not kind of. He did, uh, and. Uh, and I, I know sometimes the meetings he would ask me, well, who are you representing? These white 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 folks, or are you representing? Uh, are you with us? And I simply say, I'm, I'm representing the people that I'm organizing in the Central Ward, who were in like 99% black. Um, and also, uh, we got allies. Uh, one guy was a guy named uh, Willie Wright, uh, who became uh, oh, uh, I should say one of the things that happened. In somewhere, I guess, 64, between 64 and 66, this thing called the poverty program, anti poverty program. And because there was a national program everywhere and had money and resources, we had to figure out how to do with it. Yeah, so we got the war on poverty, yeah. yeah, so we had to figure out whether we should ignore it and, and, uh, and some other things like the VISTA program, which would bring in young, predominantly white kids into some of the same areas that we were working in. Or did we should we try to take it over? So after some major discussions, uh, we had a similar debate on this around the Democratic Party, by the way. And there was something called the United Freedom Party, which is like a third party. It was led by a guy named George Richardson, who had been a former state assemblyman in, with the Democrats, and they had broken with the Democratic boss. And, and, and as a way to threaten him, the boss, that is, he had formed the third line so that the Republicans could conceivably win. Uh, if they withheld a significant set of votes. So that was a prior discussion that had gotten us thinking about that kind of a strategy. But we decided not to do that in the case of the federal government. And uh, we decided, let's, well, we have a community base. Let's become the poverty program uh, because the feds can't do that. So we um, basically in the, the, what was called uh, District 3, which is the South Ward, we literally had the, the forces to take over the pirate party. We hired one of our own people as the uh, staff organizer, a guy named Jesse Allen. And um, Bessie Smith, uh, who was our version of Fannie Lou Hamer, was, was, the, was the chairperson, not paid, uh, Jesse was paid, uh, of, of, of the board. We, uh, our headquarters were the, the, the government office for anti-poverty program in, in the third ward. In the central ward, we didn't quite have uh, we hadn't had spent as much time developing base, so we had some base, and we were able to work with uh, a guy who was kind of like a local black nationalist, and um, named Willie Wright. And, and he, and, I mean, he almost when he gave speeches, he kind of reminded you of Malcolm X a little bit. And so, but you know, we were what tied us together. We were both insurgent forces, so we got him elected to be uh, the, the chairman of the area board too. So we essentially call, uh, controlled two boards in the two most poverty-stricken areas of Newark. And so we were a serious force uh, you know, to be dealt with. So there were some downsides I mean, uh, and, uh, to that. One is that in the focus on the government and the government largesse, we lost a little bit of the community. Not so much in terms of actual people, but being able to have that, I mean, before the government, we, we spent like 90% of our time in the community on the day and during the day. In fact, folks in these nonprofits now who go out and I even belong to a couple, it's a big thing for them to go out to their community, you know, once a week and for, for a couple of hours. And we were there six days a week and more. Frequent on the weekends, I'd take advantage of the close, closest of New York and take the subway, the path over to spend time in New York City, kind of get out of it for a minute and come back. But uh, we were there, and but we, we lost that because what happened is that uh, uh, we had these fancy phones with push buttons, and Jesse, who was the organizer, and Melvin Higgins, who was another a sub organizer, they could just spend all their time in their office and have, didn't have to go out in the community and knock on doors anymore. It's like you come to us. And we had these nice couches, leather couches that, that were for set, where before people had donated their own couches to our neighborhood storefront office. And, you know, the, and so there was a sense of ownership at the community level that they had. You know, they had put up money or they had put up their, their, their furniture. Uh, we had meals together, uh, which we had paid for and we shared. 
and uh, we were poor, but we shared, and, and, and we made do. All of a sudden, now we have nice big meeting halls and phones, and come down to, come down to my office, you know. I, I don't have time to come to your, I gotta talk to five different people, I don't have time to do that. I'm saying it in the most provocative way. It wasn't quite felt that way all the time. But that was the, somewhat, that's why I say we lost a little bit of the community uh, or the community feel of in the poverty program. But for 64, you know that little famous clause, the maximum feasible uh, percentage of the poor, we worked, we worked it to the bone. And, uh, and uh, in fact, one time, uh, a new uh, director of the, it was called the United Community Corporation, UCC, that was the official name of the poverty program in Newark. They uh, had a new director come in, for, he was from the Urban League, and he would later come to Cleveland. Uh, that's kind of interesting guy. But, uh, and the community wanted to have some fun, so they wanted to have their community action director, and so they nominated me to be the community action director. And of course, the the, the top folks didn't want that. So I didn't get the position. And I, and I remember looking at it in hindsight. There was a salary of $12,000, which was big time money. I'd never gotten $12,000 in my life. And uh, so the, the, a small part, I said, hey, I would become rich in this job. And because uh, we were la kind of living hand to foot at, at the level of, uh, uh, that's my joke, by the way, now, is that, is that I can tell you politically how I got through the 60s. But if you had to ask me economically how I managed to get through the 60s, I could be down in Guantanamo and being tortured. And I could not give you a yearly account or a monthly account uh, for all those years of how I survived. You'd have to torture me and I couldn't do it. Because I mean, that's, it, it, I mean, it was a whole different climate. You know, sharing, sleeping on people's sofas and uh, community folks letting us stay in the house dinner, I used to have this very elaborate system of where I was getting meals. And so I'd say, okay, Joe, I, I, I actually wrote it down. So uh, the first Monday and the third Tuesday of each month, I'm gonna come over to your house. I'm just gonna happen to drop by at dinner time. And because you saw me in the community, you'd say, hey, Phil, stay for dinner. Okay, you, I'm gonna come out the third Wednesday and the fifth, fifth of <laughs> last month of the month. And I do my whole couple blocks that I was kind of liaison for. So it would look spontaneous, but it would be very planned, and I would ha know I'd have meals, because uh, I'd bring news. And so I was always, it's like that famous commercial I was used to love about the guy who goes camping and all he takes is a six pack of Budweiser, and er everybody t comes and greets him and takes, them, takes good care of him. I mean, I brought the news. I could tell you what your neighbor was doing, what the, what the landlord was doing, uh, what, what, the, what the electric company was, who was fussing with that, or, or the church meeting here, and, and so I was, in some ways, a welcome guest. I mean, it was part of the organizing. And uh, I could be part of the social thing. I was telling somebody here that uh, I went, as part of exploring one of the, the Central Ward uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, I went into this bar, and they said, I, I was looking to see what was happening and going on, and I was new. And so I saw something on, on the bar that said, Christian mothers meet from two to three every Sunday. I said, oh, that's a group I better check out with. And so I asked them, I embarked in there, I said, uh, what does this Christian Brothers group do in their meetings? And the guy looked at me, kind of the way you were re 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 looking, and said, oh, we just drink Christian Brothers liquor. <laughs> <laughs> Here I thought it was going to be a social group and make connections. And so I mean, a lot of great stories like that. And that, I mean, that's what made it interesting and learning at the same time. And you felt you ranked a brother. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, we, I mean, I said we had a face in the city. And so, I mean, it, after the rebellion, uh, the folks wanted to blame the riot on us, and to some degree. Yeah. Before we get to that, would would the mayor of Newark have known who you were in these years? I don't know. Um, uh, uh, some of his his people would have. He, he had this guy named Del, Donald Malafronti, who was I can't remember his exact title, but he was like chief of staff, and I decided. Because he was at every community meeting, running down the the garbage from the mayor's office, so I personally decided to make him the the, the, the arch bad guy. And so, uh, I, anytime I had a chance, publicly or privately, I actually wrote a column. There was a guy named a white guy, uh, interesting guy uh, who's dead now, unfortunately, named Derek Winans. He came from a fairly well wealthy family in New Jersey. I I can't remember exactly what their money was from. But Derek got interested in, in the movement, 
and it was his hometown. He uh, he saw us and some of the people we were close to be, as being the real progressive force of the future. And so uh, he did all kinds of things to help us. So one of the things he did, he started a, a newspaper, uh, called a community newspaper called the Newark Advance. And I wrote a column in it, uh, I think it came out every two weeks or something like that. And so usually I'd find somebody in the column and talk about Donald Malafronti and uh, as, uh, as the arch all, bad guy of everything. And uh, so he would know who I was. And then some of the, there was a g really good guy named Doug Edwards who wrote for the Newark Star Ledger, and he covered a lot of our stuff. And uh, and uh, I don't know if he's still alive or whether he's passed on, but uh, so so I mean, we we were picking our friends and enemies be, mainly because we were a force beyond the neighborhood. If we were just in the neighborhood, the folks downtown wouldn't have cared that much. Yeah. Uh, but because we had a much bigger view, uh, we were making uh, ties, con connections in the West Ward, which by '67 we never had really got got the real basin, but we were, I mean, people were aware of us as a force in, in, in the town. As That's why I say I've never been anything quite like that since, whether Detroit or here, where uh, had that access to uh, some degree of clout. Um, how are you managing, say, 65, 66 with, um, are you, w would you have formally described yourself still then, after you, you're sort of deeply into the Newark experience as a member of SNCC? Well, no. I, I, the, the, I mean, some of this, some of this personality, some of this politics, some yeah. of this cross. And, uh, and it's the themes of you know the, the. It's really the energy of what's happening with the times. Yeah. So like I moved to December Newark in December thanks to Tom Hayden and the, the partying and all that, um, and was beginning to work with Incup again doing community work, and all of a sudden uh, SDS decided that they wanted to do this march in Washington. It would become the first major march against the war in Vietnam. It was, it was April, I think I want to say 19th, 1965, I think. Um, but anyway, it was April 65. Paul Booth, was, who was the chair, national chair of SDS at the time, was the main speaker. And his great speech was, we have to name the system, you know, not just, just that protest. But anyway, but the problem is SDS didn't have any real base in DC. And so uh, I remember they came up to Newark and, and asked uh, if I could uh, be released to go, to go back to Washington, uh, where I had got new people, and be one of the uh, organizers for the uh, for the march, and uh, which I you know, I said to the SDS people, I mean to the ERAP people, INCUP, you know, it was up to them, and they said, yeah, I, you know, this is important uh, because there's there's a bigger we're, what we're doing in Newark, we think is important, but there's also the world which we have to uh, ha have an awareness of, and and if you have some skills in DC and and can do some of this. So uh, the, the lead organizer from SDS was a guy named Paul Booth, uh, who I think at the time was the national vice president. Uh, and, and he was there, and, and I was the, the main organizer. Yeah. And, uh, and in some ways, I had done something a little different, but similar in 63 with the March on Washington Committee. And that uh, you had Byron Rustin, who again was one of our mentors, who was basically organizing the National March on Washington. Somewhere along the line, they realized they had forgotten about D.C. And we're bringing all these people from all over the country, and nobody's tried to do anything about mobilizing Washington, D.C. The people there, I mean, they're going to feel totally invaded. And what is this? And all that. So uh, he leaned on some of the nag kids, as, they, as we were called, and uh, to actually do stuff. So we formed a little group, and he said, we will basically be the organizers for uh, a guy named Cleveland Robinson, who was one of the uh, more national folks in the March on Washington, gave us money, got, or I should say got us money, he didn't give it to us personally out of his pocket, but got us some money to, 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 to set up an office, uh, or, and then later uh, a couple of desks in the main office so we could have coordination. And uh, Norman Hill from CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, was part of that. Uh, I say him because he was our generation. He was the, uh, one of the younger, upcoming people in court at the time. And uh, we basically uh, uh, organized in D.C. Cleve Robinson went to the unions in D.C. We went to a lot of the churches, community groups, so that uh, we could get a turnout. But also, uh, people could we got places for people to stay, you know, uh, who, who were coming not just for the day from other places. Uh, uh, churches opened up so the p people could go and get food and clothing. Not, not, not so much clothing, but food and water and 
uh, respite, respite for a while. And so, the, so again, it was just having gone to college and done some work in D.C. that made that possible in 63 and then also in 65 now with the anti-war thing. And then after that, I went right back to Newark. Yeah. Can I pause for just a second? We're rolling. Okay, we're off. Back up to break. So in terms of the SDS thick thing, I think some of the SDS people were moving more consciously to the anti-Vietnam War thing in, in some, of the, some degree in relationship to what the more black nationalist tone around organizing in the urban communities. It wasn't necessarily a boom, boom thing. Uh, it was gradual and some people stayed like Tom stayed for a long time, but then Tom went to Vietnam with Herbert Abbott. Ap Hapdecker and Stoughton Lynn. And then what he came back to Newark and talked about what it was like to be in Vietnam and he was able to humanize both Vietnam and the Vietnamese in a way that never would have been possible if somebody hadn't, that we knew, you know, had, you know, hadn't gone to Vietnam. But there was that shift. And so what happened with me personally, is because this goes back to NAG, is that when Stokely becomes chair of SNCC and wants to take it in a different direction, uh, I remember he comes up to Newark, we talk, and he says, you want to be part of this new action? And uh, I said, this sounds cool. And at the time, also, it allowed me to think about a different kind of focus for the Central Ward, which was more around the black power as opposed to just the black and white thing, um, and which in terms of people's real life experience, didn't, they didn't see that happening. It was more a, a con theoretical construct. Yeah. Let me catch you right at that moment, say, when, when Sokka Carmichael comes to have this conversation with you. He's, mm -hmm. he's it's spring of 66, I guess, when, mm -hmm. when um, he housed John Lewis at the right. SNCC. And, um, yeah, John still hates, still's mad about that, too. <laughs> tell, me about, tell me about how you would have, can you, in some basic summary fashion, can you describe the, the vision, the perspective you had, the, the, the way you added up what you were trying to do and what your critique was and how you wanted to get where you wanted to go? In Newark or in general? In general. Your philosophy about how to do what you wanted to do. Well, I think coming both starting with SNCC and then the, the experience in Newark with SDS is what we felt that the true bearers of future change were going to be the grassroots communities, the poor people, uh, even poor white people uh, that we were running into and, and organizing in certain places. And so we were for, in some ways doing the prototype of what would be the future society. There were going to be room for a lot of allies in the church, the labor unions, research and teachers. So, but in terms of where the force of that change was going to come from was people who had gotten the least uh, and had the least uh, stake and maintaining the, the current setup of uh, the way government and the society was set up. So, uh, and we felt that what SNCC was doing and what SDS was doing emphasized that. And that as the racial dynamic as was getting to spread around the country, uh, thanks to the urban rebellions all around the country, and we were experiencing something which we had no real answer for in terms of our Southern experience. And that was true with Martin Luther King went to Chicago. He, the same thing happened. Both at the level of the violence, but also at the level of the Democratic Party. Because our whole objective in the South had been to get into something that was keeping us out. So when Martin King gets to Chicago, Mayor Daley says, come on in, become a, become a Democrat, you know, and join the party. Of course, you're going to be at the bottom. And I mean, your pers key authorities, well-known person is all, we'll make a symbolic position for you, but everybody else is going to come in at the bottom level and, and we'll just replay the society but it, it, with, with new forms now. And the civil rights movement, the traditional Southern-based civil rights movement, had no answer for that either. So both at the level of, of the increasing violence, people not feeling a inheritance to uh, nonviolence, as well as the fact that there, were, there, there was racism without segregation laws in the North, um, we didn't have an answer to that. So it was, it was like we had to make up as we went along. And because there was no theoretical structure for how that was going to happen. What you see is, what you see is the elements that were essentially reformist and the elements that were radical. Which? Yeah, how did you, how would you oh. have said in, in my program, these are essentially reformist and these are essentially radical? Well, uh, for the most part, we were against the Democratic Party. And because we felt the Democratic Party was, sometimes people said the plantation, which uh, 
caught up and, and, and trapped all the, particularly at that time, the black initiative that was trying to, to rise up. And that uh, in some ways it might be better than the sharecropper system of the South, but it was still a bondage system. And that the, the way people, you know, call, call the, whether it was Tammany Hall in New York or, or, or the uh, Daily Machine in Chicago, uh, and variations of that around the country, they still made the rules. I mean, it was the Democratic Party uh, machine in Newark. Uh, the Italians and Irish are second class citizens, and then we were at the very bottom. And then there were a few blacks who got into those bottom level positions, but they were bottom level positions, and most of us didn't get into it at all. So that was not benefiting anybody that we were trying to organize, and, and that uh, we had to give people some sense that civic action in the old sense of that word, civic action, could make a difference. And it was not going to be through mainstream structures. Tell me more about kind of how you saw, what, what your program was to sort of overleap that obstacle posed by the Democrat Party, by that structural reality. Well, as I said, we went through, again, learning as we, we, we yeah. did. So like in Newark, there was this, uh, we made this temporary alliance with George Richardson, the former state assemblyman. Uh, to work in something called the United Freedom Party, uh, UFP, yeah, United Freedom Party. And um, that was experience, I mean, it was a little bit beyond our, our scope because we weren't that involved. Had, we were door knockers and, uh, and people's issues around housing and welfare and not electoral politics. Because electoral politics was basically a field that was way beyond our control to, and, and pretty much for any community group to actually control that. And not just at the level of money, but money being an important one as well. And, um, and we were coming abreast at the time on television, uh, which had really gotten in terms of the early 60s, but by the mid-60s, people were seeing things which never were possible to do and having access to those things. I mean, we were fortunate but in terms of today, that particularly in the black power period, that any time, I mean, you know, we used to joke, you just put on a pair of dark glasses and a leather jacket and say boo, and you're on page one, and you, especially if you have a big afro. And um, that's no longer true, of course. The press learns too. But sometimes you would use the other side or some of the apparatus of the other side to promote your cause. And so that became one of the things that happened in Stick a little later, which was unfortunate, is that we frequently talked essentially to what we used to call the white press to make announcements to black people uh, because we didn't have our own institutions to be able to do that. You know, there was a real problem with that. I mean, it worked and it didn't work because then the press could do the uh, interpretation. They would carry us, but then, so frequently, and this was true particularly with Stokely, he would always say, I'm mis being misquoted, you know, and, uh, or I'd be quoted out of context because that was, they would carry him and the, the, you know, he'd be on the front page or whatever, but usually in a way that showed him as this wild man making all these volatile statements and no sense of you know, context for that. When, when Stoker Carmichael came to you in 66 with this proposal that you were mentioning, were you, because of your history and time together back in NAG and at mm -hmm. Howard, would you have said you, were, you had a personal friendship that you were moving forward from or an alliance born of common struggle? You know, or Different roles in the common struggle. Well, some of both. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I knew his family. I knew his mother. I, I, I actually had a brief flirtation with his sister, uh, and uh, I visited his house in the Bronx. And uh, so, I mean, I mean, we weren't necessarily. I wouldn't say that he was my best friend, and I don't think he would ever say I was his best friend. And we had, we challenged each other in a lot of things. I looked up to him t totally, uh, but there were things. I mean, I was not comfortable with him on certain politically. That is on certain things. But at the level of public stance, you know, I loved him. And, and uh, because, because he just represented, uh, like some people say that Malcolm does, uh, or, or did rather, um, a sense of a black, particularly black manhood, uh, asserting itself in a way that was not convenient or comfortable for the white mainstream society. Um, t take me forward from, from your conversation with, with Carmichael in, in 66 through well, of course, we're gonna we're gonna encounter the New York Rebellion in the summer of '77. '67. Excuse me, '67, of course. And um, Carmichael will depart SNCC in '67, and mm. H.R. Brown will come, come in. in SNCC leader. Yeah. yeah. Kind of talk me through that that 
that's a lot to talk about. But I'm well, one thing I did in, in 66, as part of that interchange, is Stokely wanted people to tr who he knew to travel with him. So I, I went on several trips with him. I mean, he was speaking for what at that time was big money, $1,000 of speaking engagement, which Nick badly needed. And we went up to, to uh, uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, to the university there. And I remember going to a Charles Lloyd con a concert, first time I ever encountered Charles Lloyd. Uh, we went up to Bard College in uh, New York State, and then I went to the University of Wisconsin with him in, uh, in uh, where was it, Milwaukee or, or Madison? I think it was, uh, huh? Campuses. Yeah, I know, that's right. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say uh, Milwaukee because I remember there was this Locust Street that seemed to be everywhere. It was Main Street. Everywhere you, somehow we always came back on Locust. And, <laughs> and I think that, you know, that's, uh, I think that was Milwaukee. But in the process of flying out and talking, we'd have a lot of conversation on the plane, and and then then after the, whatever the activity, the day's event, we'd uh, kind of debrief. Uh, and um, with uh, the bar trip, uh, Cleve Sellers went up with us, um, and um, and then Stokely was being mobbed, and so he'd always be saying, "Well." You know, was I too strong on this, or what, what, was I not strong enough, or sh should I have emphasized this or that? And so it was like getting into like what's the messaging and what is it we're trying to say. But it's from the from the person who's at the very point of doing it, you know. And so uh, I mean that was a kind of unique spot, and uh, and just because of the, again the nag experience, uh, and, and and I mean he knew that we were going to be both. Uh, Totally friendly and supportive, but also critical. You know, it's like you know, um, right. yeah. Right. Right. Um, the, 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 we'll come back to Carmichael and the, his vision at, at SNCC, and but let me ask about the. You were in Newark in July of '67. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, I'd gone to visit to Cleveland uh, a week before visit my folks. And my, da my dad, who never quite made that radical step, I remember he said, oh, you got back just in time to start the riot, didn't you? Uh, my dad, unfortunately, became, who had been, as I said from earlier in this conversation, a great inspiration for me. Um, uh, as we, as the 60s progressed, we had less and less real conversation. Uh, he was just really, uh, he just couldn't, go beyond a certain point and we had gone beyond that and the fact that his son was doing it uh, the first person in the family who had a chance to complete a college education I, I dropped out of school for 11 years uh, I wouldn't go back until 75 which was after this time period we're talking about it was after he died too he died 74 um, he just got he thought that was wasting my life he said are you, are you, are you happy working for mr. Castro and this you know mr. this and this and well, that I, I guess to say that is to is to make that very important point that um, there are very substantial personal costs that come mm -hmm. with a life of commitment of the sort that you have lived. Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing with my mother was funny. She was also opposed to it, a lot of the stuff. But uh, and I used to come home, and she 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 she'd always have this conversation. But the way she'd look at me, she'd always kind of look at it, it's like from here up, my hair, from the afro. And it wasn't until e Ebony magazine did a, a whole thing on the new cultural look of the 60s and the Afro that she finally relented and said, well, as long as you cut it and keep it shaped, it's all right, you know. But, uh, but she was very much concerned with how the appearance and how people think and stuff like that. What was your reaction to Newark? To Newark? Yeah, to the, to the rebellion. Well, I mean, I think we, we participated in it. I, I was out on the streets during the Newark Rebellion. We uh, actually, as I said, was part of this more racial against the white power structure is, well, let's just say what happened. I got back from Cleveland. I had just developed this friendship uh, with a lady who was a VISTA volunteer, and she was over in the North Ward, and she was from actually from Wildwood, New Jersey, uh, beach town further south. And um, I got over to visit her, and, uh, and I stayed until a little bit after midnight, and I, and, uh, Something told me I should go home, back to the north. I was living in the Central Ward, on 18th Avenue, and so I, as I was just walking back at night, as uh, very few cars out, 
And then all of a sudden I heard police sirens. And then I, and then I heard uh, uh, cracks and stuff. Was that a gunshot? Uh, somebody shooting at somebody and so I kept walking back and so I got back over to the, the 18th Ward I mean the 18th Avenue in the Central Ward and then people tell me the whole all hell had broken loose and had broken loose at the police station which was just one block away from where I lived on 17th Avenue and where they had captured this guy I forget his name now John something he was a, taxi driver. yeah taxi driver and they had put him inside and and the people were outside the police station and then they started throwing rocks and bricks and stuff like that. And what happened is because um, uh, I lived a block away, but more importantly, uh, and so I was right there at, at the scene, is that there was this guy named BJ. And BJ was a community character who had grown up, grown up in the Central Ward. And the minute I saw the movie Zorba the Greek, that's BJ. So if you ever saw that movie, and what the kind of character Zorba was, this is what BJ was. And, uh, and he and I lived together, because what, what happened is we got an office in the Central Ward whose windows would get broken out by the local Demi Democrats. But right next door, uh, he had a place, and I moved in. I remember we had a tub, t uh, a, a, a tub right, in the, right in the kitchen, and uh, it was old-fashioned. Uh, uh, let's and um, But he knew everybody, and so, I mean, my ability to be there and organize and meet people and get accepted was through BJ. And so when we went out that night on 17th Avenue, it was like, what's happening is he knew people, I knew people, but I knew people basically through him. And we said, look, looks like something big is happening here. It's, it, we heard it was spreading over on, on Springfield Avenue, which was one of the main uh, streets. And we said, Let's not try to stop this, but let's, what we do is we're only going to attack things that are white-owned because we want to get the white domination, white ownership out of the black community, and which forced a lot of store owners to start saying, even some white folks said, put on their windows, black-owned, black-owned, you know, after they caught up on the second night or so. But I guess what I'm saying that is that we didn't want to have people be seen go out, go out wildly doing stuff. And is that we were had a very much of a clear intent, and so this was even different than within SNCC. Because I remember my friends in Detroit SNCC had basically told people to get off the streets, and they had no street role, and so we were right there. I actually got beat up uh, by the police that night. Uh, well, the second night, because um, what happened is it's really stupid. Uh, I, we were the, there were some housing projects right near the 17th Avenue it's called, called the uh, uh, Hayes Homes. Uh, and um, I, I, I have no idea if they're still standing. But uh, I saw a bunch of policemen and being cocky and young and totally stupid, I yelled, Black Power! Like this is what was happening. And they said, Stop right there! So I had about less than two seconds to figure out whether I could run fast enough to get into the projects. Because I knew once I got in the projects, they, they, they'd never find me. But the question is, how f would they chase me? How, how fast their guns could shoot? How good could sh So I decided, well, I think I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to take that risk. So all of a sudden, I, I was with a guy from the neighborhood, a guy named Joe Whitley, who was a bartender at a bar in, 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 in the Central Ward. And they stopped us, and they said, now, what did you say? And these are about eight really big guys. They're all bigger than both me and Joe. And so in some little squeaky voice, I said, black power. Because <laughs> I couldn't recant what I had said. But, but uh, you know, this was totally intimidating. They had guns and everything. And so they grabbed us. And what was really interesting is, uh, both then and hindsight, they beat us. But what they did was they used rubber truncheons. They didn't use anything that would leave marks. And um, so they just came and turned us around, hit us, hit us like this, all this. And what happened is, this is where the earlier civil rights training really paid off, back in the nonviolent days, because I knew how to turn and lean and, you know, so that they couldn't get in here and all that stuff and protect my head. And so I absorbed some of the blows. But my friend Joe didn't. Uh, so what happened is that they left us there. Joe was lying, lying on the sidewalk. You know, I was on the sidewalk, but I bounced up and, and so I had to take him home, essentially. And then once, the, I was really mad by then, so we ended up uh, going into one of the neighborhood bars and just 
and just take, of course, this is where the looting part came in because the, all, all these beer kids, people just say, hey, we're all, the term was, we're going to liberate that, you know, for, take it over to my house, we're going to consume it. But uh, so uh, it was a very, you know, I, I could have gotten killed easily that night. And then about two nights later, I was, uh, they, they, could, they, they had a curfew. And so I was out past the curfew out on South Orange Avenue. And so I had to again call around some community resources to, uh, I uh, didn't have cell phones. If I had cell phone, that would have been great. I could have called a few people. Yeah, and so I just knocked on a couple of doors and I said, I'm with the Newark group and we've been working around you know, black support and civil rights and black power. And could I stay here for a while? And they let me in. If not, I would have been out in the street. There were snipers out in the street. We actually knew a couple of snipers who were who, who were firing on the cops. But uh, uh, we weren't doing that. But uh, we, I didn't want to get caught in the middle of that either. So I mean, they let me in. So that was the night that I got saved and from being out in the street. So there were several you know occasions like that that you know where that happened during the New York Rebellion. So but the next morning uh, of the first night, I came out back over to the South Ward, had breakfast with some SDS friends. And then uh, sitting up in, the, in this fire, and there was some older black woman. I could hear in the back of them, they were talking about all the stuff that, that happened last night. And she said, it's about time they did this. They've been doing it around the country, and it's about time to do it here. And so that kept me that our message and our campaigns of the six to eight months previous to that in terms of the racial polarizing around white control, not necessarily just white people, but the, the white control, had had some positive effect. Because I remember in a couple other places, Cleveland being one of them, my hometown, when we had the Huff Rebellion, there was a very apologetic, we just, you know, we, 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 we acted like animals, we just overacted. It, uh, that's why we made sure to say this was a rebellion, not just a riot, uh, making those distinctions in terms of the organizing. So that people who had stood up in a slightly unusual way, you know, felt that they had, they had manifested something important and, and feeling good, good about it, which is one of the reasons why the state police really felt that we were, had a real hand in promoting and, and being a part of the Newark, Newark Rebellion. Yeah. The uh, massive uh, police response, um, did, you, did you emerge from that, it sounds as if you emerged from that, that, that five days um, feeling more inspired by the example of this self-assertion of the black community mm -hmm. than you did um, discouraged by the state's capacity to respond. Uh, 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 yes, definitely. In fact, we were hoping the state wouldn't have a good capacity to respond. <laughs> they would have put us in jail, I guess. <laughs> that would have been probably, probably some of the proper response. Or and of course, there were of course all these commissions that came afterwards that were set up. Uh, I, th I can't remember. It was a big one in, in in New Jersey to investigate what had happened and why this had happened, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And but uh, we felt that the pol to go from so where do we want to go from there? Then I mean, because that's from the organizer standpoint, okay, we had the great mass revolt out in the street. We did something totally unprecedented, and where do we go from now? Yeah. So let's make this an opportunity to go for black political power. And it's out of that came the idea of getting the black mayor. And so we had begun this earlier on in some ways. Uh, in 1966, there had been a mayoral election. Yeah, six, 66, yeah. And uh, we, we couldn't get quite unity for, for who should run for mayor, of course, for the, the black candidate. And so George Richardson, who had been a state assemblyman and lived in Newark, wanted to run. And, and so what he did was, but he wanted a power base, kind of like uh, Bill Nolan around the right to work thing. So instead of running for, for mayor, he wanted a power base, so he ran for central ward councilman. And we, we, and we put up, just like the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party put up the mock election uh, for, for governor back in, in uh, what was that, 63, 60, is we did something for mayor. We, we said, let's, we have to have a black mayoral candidate to get people thinking about voting for a black man for mayor. So we found this guy uh, named Ken Gibson, who was a civil engineer, 
Uh, he seemed to be, he was very, he was middle class, not excessively, but, but clearly that's where he, he came out of. Uh, didn't have any great foreign, pol foreign po policies around a lot of stuff, but didn't have any real, uh, gar I mean, track record in a negative way either. And he hadn't antagonized many folks in the black community, so we put him up for a run for black mayor. Uh, he lost, but he got a credible amount of votes. And, um, and so uh, what happened, though, in 1970, leading up to that, is then Richardson decides he really wants to run for mayor. And uh, so does Gibson now. And so we, that's why we had a political convention so that there would be a candidate that, that comes out of the black community. It was actually the black and Puerto Rican, because we, we were, at that time, maybe you noticed that there were more and more Puerto Ricans living. There was a woman named Hilda Hildago, who had been um, very uh, uh, supportive around a lot of the black causes and realizing that the Puerto Ricans had more at stake with the black community there. And so that there was that link early on. So we had this black and Puerto Rican convention, and we not nominated Ken Gibson for, for, for mayor. And then uh, the, uh, that was in the early 70, I think. I can't remember. Either late 69 or early 70. And then, of course, the election in, was in 70, and then he ran for mayor and won. Let me pull you back to one. But, and I say yeah. the other side, out of total arrogance, the, there were four Italians who ran against them. I mean, they just assumed that they could beat any black candidate. So they ran four of them, and of course they split the vote, and then Gibson won easily. Small Australian game ball. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me pull you back to uh, one other very significant in, uh, outcome post post July of '67. Um, uh, you will work with Nathan Wright to organize the first Black Bar Convention, National mm -hmm. Black Bar Convention in New yeah. York. Um, can you describe the? That, that process, that effort to bring that together, and what, and, and, and the, the vision that animated that, mm -hmm. that convention, and what you saw looking ahead from, from that moment. Well, I think part of the vision was how do you go from community power to broader urban power, uh, even taste of national power and stuff like that, and how do we sit down with different parts of the black community, some of the pro more progressive black politicians, uh, some of the black business people, some of the folks who were going from that thing of being Negro to being black. Uh, it didn't make them revolutionaries, but at least they were having progressive thinking. Of course, you had progressive music, Motown, Marvin Gaye, uh, was, you're hearing on the radio now, uh, was more uh, Aretha Franklin was coming up in this period. So uh, it just seemed, it, I mean, we were going over to the Apollo Theater every week, weekend and, and over in New York. And so it seemed like there were a lot of things that were just coming falling together. And so uh, the vision we were putting out was a, a different kind of black America uh, that, that, that united different parts of the community, was in struggle against uh, all forms of white domination and white control. But as Leroy Jones, in some ways, I think, uh, symbolized it is, in terms of more modern black nationalism, which makes them a little different than others, is that Newark is our battleground. We're not talking about Africa like Marcus Garvey. We're not talking about the black world. I mean, we may have some ideas on that, but that's not where, what we're spending any time working on. And we're talking about how do we get black power right below our feet. And our feet are here in Newark, New Jersey. And so, so from a national, a more traditional nationalist perspective, uh, he, brought that, he brought that in, that the power. He also brought in the Nation of Islam uh, as, as part of that. And so we were able to talk this idea of what was called the Black United Front, which is what Stokely wanted to do in D.C. after he left as chairman of SNCC in 67. And, um, and, and trying to build a unity around politics in the black community, which had, hadn't happened in modern times. So that was, in some ways, the broader vision. And that, but we needed candidates and working relationships at different levels, which we had, I mean, we went into traditional Baptist churches and did this. And you know, I always say the 60s was a period when you could go from politically wanting to have a white I mean, a, a hot dog next to a white person in the early 60s talking about uh, mass revolution, revolutionary politics, all in the space of, I mean, when you think about what happened in the 60s, that, that all that continuum was just uh, 
amazing. That's why, particularly in the 70s and 80s, you know, it's like when that didn't exist in the same way, people were lost. A lot of people who were activists were lost because it's like, we, you know, so much happened in, in that in that short time period. Um, let me ask for let me ask you if you would to de to describe um, your emergence through SNCC as, as SNCC's national director in '68. Well, um, well, what happened increasingly as the years went on, and both in terms of financial resources lessening, some of which we helped. We shot ourselves in the foot. I think probably always. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, we uh, when we came out of the end of the war in Vietnam, just like Martin Luther King's organization suffered some financial and as well as political repercussions. Um, him probably more than we did because at least after the march in Washington, he was seen as a national black leader to a great degree, and people like Lyndon Johnson were seen working with him. And all of a sudden, he's now opposing the Vietnam War, which is Johnson's war. And, they were, and the ramifications of that on SCLC, his group, I think were much more tremendous than on us. We never were quite at that lofty stand. But still, I mean, there were people who didn't think, I mean, we're talking about civil rights. And now, that's not the position that African Americans are not supposed to get in talking, critiquing foreign policy. That's an, a whole other section of the world that does that, or the US government or the US civil society. But civil rights is about local, domestic, and black problem, and we are going beyond that. So that was, so we lost some money on that, and as well as some political support. Uh, it got brought us closer to the anti-war movements and the peace movement, to be sure, but uh, it lost us some of the mainstream people who had really, in terms of the 60s, the, the Mississippi Challenge and, and the Freedom Party and the, the Freedom Schools and City, which had really you know, gotten on to us. Um, and then, of, and then in '66, uh, thanks to a research paper by this uh, one of our research people in National SNCC, guy named Jack Menace. Oh, uh, I always call him uh, Jack Daniels, uh, uh, drinking uh, brilliant guy. Um, he re did a research paper on Israel, and out of that, uh, determined that SNCC, I mean that 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 not SNCC, but that Israel was a Zionist was a Zionist country. It was basically uh, oppressing the people, the Palestinians, and blah, 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 blah. And SNCC people read it and supported it. So we basically came out against Zionism and, and Israel. So that created a whole nother uh, stir of, of consternation, and, and particularly in the more liberal movements uh, of the United States. I remember in New York, we had, at that time, we had a newspaper. and. Uh, I was going to take the newspaper over to a meeting, community meeting, uh, in somewhere in, in Manhattan. Uh, and I got there at the very end of uh, the meeting, and people were walking out of the door. And I went up to the person who was chairing the meeting. I said, could I make an announcement? And, and, and I said, I have the new newspaper of SNCC with the article on, on Israel and Zionism. People literally turned around who had walked outside. <laughs> I got mobbed. <laughs> I mean, not physically mob, but I mean, people, everybody wanted the, that paper because that was the issue, and and I was sold out in probably about five minutes, and uh, uh, it was just that 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 point, and um, so, but that issue, it, in in many ways, rever reverberated on us negatively in terms of the more broader, uh, I mean, the liberal movements of the time, and it was a t thing between liberalism and radicalism, not just around Israel, but Vietnam probably being more of a point thing. Um, and, and then are you just for peace? Uh, are you for liberation of Vietnam? That was another little uh, side point within that debate as well. And we supported the, the National Liberation Front of the, Viet, of, of the Vietnamese people. And, and I did that even more so after going to Cuba and meeting some of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let, let me, um, you, oh, I don't like the files that get too big. It makes it hard for the... Yeah. the I'm, joking. I'm, yeah. I'm joking, I'm yeah. joking. I know you're a pro, so... Well, there's no, I mean, we have like uh, another two hours after that. No, that's we won't keep you two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Are we? We're running over. Okay, we're back on. We still have two hours on this one, so okay. we need to... Mm. Yeah, we're good. Um, you've mentioned the financial pressures that increasingly were really battering groups like SNCC mm -hmm. after, say, 64. Yeah, CORE was going through some of that, too. Sure. Um, you've mentioned um, the... the the Israel mm -hmm. tension. You've mentioned um, the anti-war stuff. Um, you, you haven't talked, and I'd love to get your perspective on the simultaneous 
negative consequences of, say, COINTELPRO and state security and the whole campaign to come after um, pretty much mm -hmm. all the heart of this movement. Yeah, I think we weren't totally aware of all of it at the time. And that, I mean, by the time the Panthers, for example, became more prominent, it became much, much clearer. Um, but uh, we, we knew that there were things that were happening. Um, people became aware of agents in the movement. Uh, who were they? How do we recognize them? What would they be doing? What do we have that's so sensitive that anybody would particularly want? And, uh, and, trend, and then coming up, well, how do we deal with this? How, I mean, how, how, how do we develop a strategy you know, for, for, for dealing with, with internal agents? And what do we talk about? Um, so, so that was one piece of it. Uh, another piece is that it just seemed that particularly the FBI and maybe COINTELPRO, wasn't always clear to who was which, was more interested in dividing the black movement and, and then trying to get people one by one from that. So particularly when the Panthers started becoming a more of a prominent organization, there were real attempts to pit the Panthers against SNCC. And, um, so uh, uh, one of our uh, key leaders in New Jersey, you know, came to us and said, "You know, I got a visit from the FBI, and they uh, t uh, came in the, my house." He said, and a guy named Irving Davis, uh, and uh, he, they dropped a hundred dollars, which was more then than it is today. Uh, on my bed and said, uh, w we need to talk to you and you, we need to, you need to talk to us and we'll make it easier for you and here's some money uh, you know, for you. And he, he turned it down and told him to leave the house. Another time they would tell people that uh, the Panthers were out to get us and that uh, the Panthers hadn't quite liked some of the things we were saying. This was another process of, which is not about going to Pro so much, is uh, uh, there was this attempt to bring the two organizations together into either an alliance, as we called it, or a merger, as the Panthers called it. And um, this is right around the time I was became head of SNCC. And um, Huey Newton and the Panther Central Committee had literally drafted on their own three of our best known people, Stokely, Rapp, and James Foreman, into their organization. Uh, Stokely was the, drafted as a, he really created a whole new position called Prime Minister. Uh, this was 1967, and uh, Foreman was made the Minister of, of Foreign Affairs, and uh, Rapp was the Minister of Justice. And, um, and there was a big thing at Huey's birthday party in February 17th here in Oakland, and I think they did something similar in L L.A., where it was basically publicizing the Foreman was there, um, uh, Stokely was there, he, he was by this time the ex-chair, uh, and Rapp had, was technically the chair in, in February. Rapp couldn't travel because uh, he had got on his gun charge and he could only travel, if at all, with his l lawyer who was the late William Kunstler. And, 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 and there were a couple trips they went on. Uh, one, one, I guess, was to L.A. because Rapp did, was at that event, so I guess Kunstler went with him. But uh, so he, he wasn't quite as able to travel as Stokely and, and, uh, and Foreman, but uh, it was part of bringing us in. But there were tensions, and it was like, well, do we agree with everything the pa Panthers are saying? Do they agree with their style of organization? Which is beyond whether we think they're a great organization. Um, but are they our organization? And do we want to become Panthers? And most of us kind of were uh, lukewarm on that at best, and uh, some people were saying no. And other folks were saying, this is a historical opportunity. Hey, we represent the more educated, intellectual folks. The Panthers represent the street force, the brothers and the sisters on the street. And this would be a historic alliance within a new organization. But um, I think the feeling was that we were getting eaten up, or were, that, would, that was an attempt. And Eldridge Cleaver, particularly, because uh, Huey was in jail, uh, was uh, the point person for uh, a lot of this discussion and dialogue. And um, I guess at uh, the meeting that I was made chairman of SNCC, we voted on the Panther program. And we said that we thought it was a good program, but it was not 
either our program or necessarily the, pro the revolutionary program. And somehow that got back to the Panthers and that, uh, of course. And then at a certain point, when there was some more friction, uh, which got almost physical in some ways, um, that uh, we said we can't be in a group with this kind of people. So as Chair of SNCC, I said there's no, you know, there's certainly no merger and there's not even a clear alliance. And, um, and then we spent some time in 68 uh, and I had personally trying to work with local groups, again, the local focus uh, of groups that would, had been inspired by what the Panthers were doing, but might have a slightly different politics. So one particular group I spent some time with was a group called the Black Liberators out in St. Louis. And in fact, managed to get arrested with them. And uh, Bill Kunstler had to come out there and drag me out of jail. Though what was also really great was my uncle, who's a lawyer. He, he wanted to join the joined the, the legal team and he did he came in and uh, and to my horror they said that uh, they should record they should play the speech to the jury to see if the police were warranted and the police had actually pulled out an old anti-labor law called unlawful assembly which had only been used back in the 30s and hadn't been used since then and that was what we were arrested for unlawful assembly and uh, I thought I said some pretty provocative things in the speech that night, but the jury thought that uh, it wasn't necessarily beyond the pale, and uh, we got off. As you remember, what would you have said that was, would have been regarded as most provocative? You know, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe I had thought about this a couple of days, I might think. I mean, I can't remember. I mean, I was generally supportive of the, uh, of the uprisings uh, in the... Uh, that were happening around the country. This was still 68, so there were still rebellions after Detroit and Newark. And I was supporting the people of the world, the, the kind of the third world concept uh, that we were all generally supportive of at that time. And I don't even know if I said anything that specific about St. Louis itself. I can't, I, I, I probably try to, because I like to try to make stuff more, not less abstract. And so I probably might have said something about the local officials. But, uh, and then I remember, uh, I, was, I really got pissed off because I, afterwards, uh, you, you get mobbed, of course, and there was this really nice looking sister who came up and said, you know, she'd like to meet me and there was a party later on that, that I was invited to. So I was prepared to go to this party and meet the sister again. <laughs> and we ended up get, getting arrested right in the middle of the street and, and then sent to the workhouse. And that was interesting too because uh, in many ways, because we were known, we were uh, celebrities, the, the, the prisoners caught, uh, treated us extremely well. It was like being a mafia don uh, in, in the prison. Uh, even the, the warden, the, this was a black penitentiary in a place called Kinlock, a uh, small, predominantly black town outside of St. Louis. And I mean, he let us go in and use his telephone uh, you know, to talk to the national press or whoever. And, and uh, the prisoners would come up and say, hey, man, I can get you a good sandwich tonight, or, or you smoke, uh, I didn't smoke, but you know, we'll get you some cigarettes and all that. This is like, we were big shit. And of course, the uh, warden was afraid we were gonna organize the prisoners against him, of course. And so he was nice for that, that was why he was nice. And so it was a, it was a little, this a side experience, but sure. it was, you know, it was did, did you have confidence uh, when you took the helmet snick that you could, so much was swirling, there was so much volatility, membership, staff, uh, finances, relationships, with the, this whole struggle with the Panthers, all these things. Did you have, what, what was your sense of the likelihood that you could? Be successful? Yeah. Well, look at Obama today after George Bush <laughs> context. No, it, I actually did feel that way. And you did feel that way. Yeah, yeah. and I must admit it had a first a major depression for me uh -huh. uh, in the some of the following years yeah. that I wasn't able to do more than I could. I mean, I, I, looking back on it, in terms, of, in terms of my head, in terms of rationality, looking like you say, as you pose the question, given what was going on, uh, SNCC was on a downright, downward cycle pretty much ever since 64, after, after the Atlantic City thing. Uh, we did kind of revamp in 65 and did some stuff. Stokely and, uh, took some folks to Alabama, where we had a project, and that, how that came the Lowndes County organization so there was some motion but still people were leaving they were doing other things and it was like almost kind of big even 
for people who weren't leaving for political reasons so much. It was like, I've been in this battle too long. As I say, it was like being in a war. And I need to do, go do something else. Uh, maybe related, but not here. And so we were losing membership, losing money, um, uh, and the meetings were getting dispirited. This was a time when the white folks were asked to leave. And, and so that became a whole another major issue in itself. And so there was a lot of this is even before I got there. And, uh, but, you know, there was still an organization in 67 and 67 and 68. Um, and, uh, and I felt that we could turn the tide, maybe a different version. And, uh, and, and, and my focus was to try to, again, given my history and what I learned in SNCC and SDS, is do it more at the grassroots level. That SNCC was not going to be the organization. That was always the difference between the, the SNCC approach and the Panther approach. I mean, the Panthers went around, like a lot of groups, like NAACP, organizing chapters around the country. Uh, and while we had a couple chapters, that was, the, uh, when we organized something, it was always a people's thing. So, uh, like the Lowndes County, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Newark Community Union Project, stuff like that. Because we knew at some level we were always gonna leave. Right? And, and so, who had to have the real ownership of this from the very beginning were the people. And, and uh, so that was really part of our organizing thing. And so, uh, in trying to do some type of national community unions focus of, of uh, grassroots unity, it was not so much SNCC was doing this, but it was ba basically joining with groups that were kind of radical grassrootsy around the country, Black Liberators in St. Louis, uh, a group called JOMO in um, uh, 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 Jackson, uh, Jacksonville and Orlando, uh, Florida. Uh, some folks out in L.A. Uh, who had come out of the Watts Rebellion. And uh, but looking at groups like that, you know, who had local base and, and traction in their own communities and who uh, would be empowered by having national connections, national networks. Or some kind of uh, national consortium. Yeah, the national consortium. I mean, whether that would become a political party or what, we never got to f finesse. I mean, but uh, at least in one year, that was, that was generally my focus. Stokely had a little different focus. And, I mean, he uh, wanted to do this Black United Front and idea, which he tried to do in Washington, and, and I guess had a little bit of attraction while he was physically on the scene. But at a certain level, you're bringing together interests that are really are not going to stay together. Uh, maybe in a perfect world, they might stay together a little bit, but you have this bigger world, uh, like the so-called white power elite, and which will find ways to, through, and, and, through the carrot or through the stick to pry people apart and say you have other interests besides just joining up with a bunch of you know, black radicals. And that's generally been what's happened around the country around that. Let me have you, let me have you take this um, moment to, to tell the story of um, the, the work you did in Cuba. Well, part of the uh, third world focus is that th there were different uh, places around the world that we were generally supportive of. And uh, the idea of the Vincent Ramos Brigade, which interestingly enough still exists today, it's one of the things I I'm not that t close to any longer, but uh, not for political reasons, just doing different things, and it's more younger people now who kind of go, is the idea of both meeting people uh, in third world countries and we had been somewhat inspired by the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And some of us wanted to go fight in Vietnam against the United States invading troops. That was very rhetorical, but that was at least the idea that was put out there. Like, um, just given what's happened more recently, this guy here locally, I can't think of his name now, he's in jail, who was supporting Al Qaeda, and they have him in jail now. and. I can't, John Howard something, I can't remember his name, uh, but he's from Mill Valley over in, in Marin. So luckily that never happened, and wiser heads came down, uh, starting with the Vietnamese themselves, and they said, you know, there's some place closer that is, needs your help, and, that, uh, and you could do something where you don't need to actually have to physically fight, because they've actually been successful, but they could use other kinds of help from you, and that's Cuba, and so that's what so that, so that was the logic of what brought Cuba into our eyes, uh, away from Vietnam, even in the middle of the anti-Vietnam War. And so 
Um, some people who were in the movements, uh, people from SDS uh, representing the white movement, some people from the Chicano movement, which was developing, and the black movement. And the Panthers were too busy, thankfully. And so they said, well, somebody from SNCC should do it. And uh, when I had been chair of SNCC, I had sent some people uh, in delegation to Cuba. Actually, we sent one to North Korea. Uh, we had sent one to Africa, to Tanzania. We had a Pan-African Skills Program in Tanzania and uh, Zimbabwe, where we brought in people who had technical skills, African Americans, to help in those countries. So there was some precedent for thinking about that. So uh, we joined the National Committee and, uh, and organized the uh, uh, first, uh, f actually four brigades. Uh, I w I, uh, and what happened in the first one well, I mean, the program, uh, which was part of the time, the propaganda of the time, is we were going to bring 300 black people, 300 brown people, and 300 uh, white people to, uh, to Cuba. So 900 people. Uh, it turned out we, there were 200 people who actually showed up for that first Vince of Ramos Brigade, and most of them were white. And we felt we had failed. Cubans didn't think that, but we felt that, because that was what we had projected. And, and also, in hindsight, even then, we realized that we had been a little bit uh, off, off kilter in, in our target. But what we felt was it was important to uh, build the movements uh, and, and see the brigade as an organizing arm. So uh, we organized for the second brigade, which was in March of, uh, of 1970, and we had over 800 people there, which was the biggest brigade ever. Uh, I mean, the Cubans even told us we had too many people. Uh, not because we had too many people, but because their resources, to house us, to, ch to take us around, to feed us. At the same time, they were doing other things in Cuba, you know, like th th they were doing a 10, mi 10 million ton sugar harvest the year we were there. Is, uh, it was just, uh, and they were in a rich country, you know, so, so they couldn't do that. So, but the point was we had made is that, uh, that, that there was a real enthusiasm in the movement and f for this, and it did a lot of different things. I mean, what it, what it did for me, uh, it took us out of the United States in a way that we could look at the U.S. movement in a, in a more objective way. So we have people sitting around in the camps in Cuba uh, where we're working and I'm meeting people from all over the country in a way that I could never do that in, in the United States. They could meet each other, meeting people from different movements. Uh, I mean, sometimes our rhetoric was a little wild. I mean, I, I was thinking one time, uh, being the Cuban she, you have a bunch of African Americans who said they want the, the 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 Republic of New Africa. We want the five states of uh, of uh, of the South. Then the Chicanos would come and talk about Aslan and, and the Southwest. This was going to be a, the new Chicano nation. Then the Indians were coming talk talking about you know taking over some of the stuff. It's like, well, is there enough space for all that? Happen? <laughs> what happens to the white people? You know, but that's our youthful youthful craziness. But. Uh, uh, but we built some bonds, both with the Cubans. Uh, uh, I mean, I loved it that the Cubans would basically cut sugar cane and work all day and then have parties and dance and drink rum. I mean, it was a way, something you could identify. I mean, the Russians, I mean, you could read about the Soviet Revolution and, and all the discipline and the co democratic centralism and all that. But it, it wasn't like, well, that's not my revolution, you know. It's like, what's it, what's it, who was it that Emma Goldman says, I can't dance in my revolution, there's not going to be a revolution? And, and you felt the Cubans understood all that, you know. There was this problem, which wasn't big at the time. I remember it came up around Grenada, about the God, the spiritualism piece. And I remember some Grenadians who were really like the Cuban model said that it wouldn't work in Cuba, I mean in Grenada, because uh, you got to have a little God, space for God in our movement, in, in, in our liberation force. Uh, so that's a, that's a, an aside, but um, so we got a sense of some, some real people who had made a revolution, and as real human beings who had real problems, people who had divorced their wives or uh, wives who became independent, left their husbands, and uh, and uh, and so some of the downsides, but or or the you know the continuing struggle. Uh, people going to meetings eight nights a week, not seeing their kids on a regular basis, their kids being schooled by a community, and well, what happened to my mommy and my daddy, you know, kind of thing. And uh, so the real, it, so it, w it wasn't glossed over. Um, 
so that was great. Um, got to learn certain basic things. Like when, when we say 10 o'clock, we mean 10 o'clock. And this is a Latin country too, you know. You know, the, we were going to have a meeting the next day or later that day. Uh, the Cubans get us and say, compañeros, uh, it is now 4 o'clock. We are going to meet at 6 o'clock. Let's, let's synchronize our watches so we come here at 6 o'clock because we, we're doing important business. And that was something that we, you know, we all have this thing called CP time, colored people's time. Black, Latinos, and you know, we'll show up. The meeting starts when, sh when we show up. And very lackadaisical form. So the Cubans really helped us think that in terms of if you're, if you're going to be doing stuff for the people, representing people on the people's time, then you need to have some degree of discipline. Uh, so little things like that, but also um, uh, meeting people. Cuba was a center for revolutionaries from all over the world. So, I mean, I remember this guy, uh, a guy named Ernesto from Angola, and he came, we just met him at the Isle of Youth, and he just talked about his country and his struggle. And one of the things I got from people like him and other people was uh, we met some Brazilians who at that time were, uh, uh, had been, couldn't be in Brazil, uh, as how well they could talk about their whole country. And I said, you know, I know people who can talk about Harlem, or some community folks who can talk about the south side or the west side of their town, uh, but can they really talk about their state, their country, other cities in the country? I mean, do we have a view of our country uh, that's concrete and, uh, and, um, and not just rhetorical that we can actually talk about? And so listening to those folks do that. I mean, granted, Angola is smaller than, than uh, the United States, uh, but I mean, is how do we develop the kind of learning and the discipline the, to, to do that kind of thing. Uh, I remember meeting with some of the Vietnamese, this guy from Vietnam, and he said to me, he says, well, what's the labor movement like in your country? So my first reaction was, well, just a bunch of sellouts. Next question. What's the labor movement about in your country? Could you tell us about that in detail? So in the two hours, I mean, he, he made me backtrack and get through some of my stereotypes. Which are the progressive unions? Which are the non-progressive unions? What makes them progressive? What makes the others not progressive? What's their constituency? What's their base? Uh, is there possibly, I, 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 I mean, their focus, of course, was in terms of what groups in the labor movement might be more open to being anti-war activity. But still, the thinking of how to dissect a whole movement beyond the, simple, the little simple stuff that we were doing, you know, was a, a learning process. Is if you're going to meet with revolutionaries and be with revolutionaries, you've got to, you know, basically have serious conversations based on real things. And so, that was real useful. I mean, uh, I had been kind of an organizer of the brigade, and then the second brigade came, the third brigade came down later in the summer, and so I remember asking the Cubans if I could stay on for another couple of months so I could actually enjoy the country. So I was at the Havana uh, Libre, as they call it, the old Hilton Hotel, and one of the things I learned to like, I, I say this now, because I, I, I was on their dime, essentially, is, um, was fish. Uh, I grew up in Cleveland, no fresh fish around. I ate sardines, that was, that, that was my, and maybe tuna fish sandwiches, that was my idea of fish. And th didn't all fish have these little bones that you might, so one of the things I decided to do in the Havana Libre, I said there's this fish here every day. Though what's interesting though, is Cuba being an island didn't have a fishing industry. And it was only thanks to the Japanese uh, who came in and showed them how to do uh, refrigeration to make it something that they could do all over the island. Uh, because if you could get fish out, obviously, if you were rich or if you lived right near the coast and fixed it that day, but you couldn't take it inland. And Cuba's a big, fat island. It's not, you know, so there was never a real taste for fish on the island. So uh, that's a little story on the side. But, so, but I used to go in there and get, I said, I wonder what halibut tastes like. I wonder what this tastes like. What's, what's perch like? And I could just do it. And so it gave, it, I mean, that's a small piece, but, but, uh, and then we had these wonderful meetings with the Vietnamese. Uh, it's a conference that never came out, is that the, the Vietnamese wanted to or, or, organize an anti-war conference that would include folks from the United States and a few other countries. And um, it was going to be in Cuba, because that was the place we had all access. And I was asked, along with a couple of other folks, actually, Abby Hoffman from the Yippies was there. and. And as part of the planning group, and I got to meet with the Yippies for the first time. I mean, I would heard of them and I'd seen them at things, but to actually be in hotel rooms with staying in the hotel with the Yippies was a, a thing in itself. That's another chapter <laughs> somewhere, some book. Uh, Jerry Hoffman, 
But um, you're talking to the Vietnamese about what they were going through and how they viewed the world, how they viewed their struggle. Uh, I remember after one day, after some really serious, intensive U.S. bombing of North Vietnam, uh, the young Vietnamese brother says, I can't meet with you today. I'm just really feeling too anti-American, and it's really not about you. Please understand that, but I just can't do this today. And he just went off, and then you saw him a couple days later. And then, you know, just a lot of great, great stuff. I mean, the humanism comes out. I remember when we were telling a joke, and there was a woman sitting there, a Vietnamese woman, and, uh, and I started to stop it because I was, I was going to use a kind of uh, cuss word or stuff. And he said, oh, no, 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 Madam Soso, she's liberated. You can say, you can say this, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then just the physical thing, like some of the men walking down, holding hands with each other uh, in a way that you would not see outside the gay movement, which was still very m new in the United States uh, there. And I remember one time uh, we, we were going for a lunch thing and, uh, to get, and it was cafeteria style, it was really crowded, and, and the Vietnamese guy was sitting down, and I said, oh, you sit down. And then he says, well, here, you sit on my lap. Uh, and I, oh, no, I'm bigger than you. I can't do this. Two men sitting on each other's lap. We can't do this. <laughs> Stop. And, yeah, and he, he was just cool with it, you know. So. But so it was just constant learning on so many levels. Uh, I'm just, you, you just <laughs> something to come to mind. And, and, let let me pause here for just a sec, and then we'll come back to you. Um, We're going. We're back after a break. Yeah. yeah. The struggle continues. A uh, luta continua, as they say in Portuguese. And that uh, it takes different phases. You learn some things, you move forward, and that's like, and then uh, the other side learns stuff. I mean, even the work around immigration, uh, the different levels. I mean, the thing that we like about immigration is that it's both a domestic issue and an international issue. Uh, one very difference is that, um, and I say a lot of this when I go, when I talk about the, talking about then and now. And I just came back from Georgia, uh, uh, in Atlanta, where we were trying to do some work around this eight, uh, House Bill 87, and we were going to get to Alabama, but we ran out of time, so that's a, that's a future trip. But um, is that the logic of the 60s was that we were fighting against the racist segregationists, state governors, state uh, s city local officials, and we were basically fighting for our civil rights, which were national, and we were basically wanted the federal government to come in and take care of these bad guys, either through the National Guard if necessary, through uh, deputi deputizing, that's why we pushed with Robert Kennedy and J J John Kennedy and later with Johnson, to come in because the government was going to take care of this and live up, we were forcing the government to live up to its standards. What we find with immigration is that the government is not the savior, it's the problem. And because there's a world system uh, of giant corporations, laws like uh, NAFTA and these other things that the United States is, as the, the major Western power is on top of. And that um, that the problems of, that are spurring the mass migration and immigration, um, not just to the United States, but all over the world, are based on that type of unequal world level. And so in terms of trying to fight around against racism uh, uh, at a higher level, uh, uh, fighting against economic corporations at a higher level, is we're running into the set of uh, the, system, the system of, uh, some people in the old days called it imperialism, uh, but economic globalization or whatever you want to call it, that, that, that the United States government is very much a part of. And that part of the immigration problem, as it gets stated, is we're only talking about one part of it. We're talking about, you know, it's a push-pull. And what's happening is we're just talking about the people who come here. And we are not talking about the situation that, that forces them to leave their countries and the role of the United States government and other Western governments and banks and corporations in that. Uh, the, and that's not stopping. So you can't really stop the, the immigration as it gets put out in the U.S. press unless you do both ends. You just can't punish the people who come, um, or whether they come to England or whether they come to, to different parts within country or within continent. So anyway, so I mean, there's a continuing learning and, and, and refining old concepts, developing new concepts, and, but still looking at the question, uh, which, which to me is the how, how does the race and class thing 
come together, and somewhat increasingly gender is part of that, and uh, in a way that we started in the 60s and uh, in the 70s, and now in the 21st century is playing a major role. I, c I can't thank you enough. It's just mm -hmm. been a real honor and privilege yeah. to be with you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.